I tell the students at BRSM, um, and maybe I'll have an opportunity later on in the conference to share a little bit of our vision at BRSM and what makes us different. But um, I'm not interested in raising up professional preachers or political pastors. I want praying prophets. And um, I remember when I was at uh, my Bible college, Tamara, they taught me a lie. They taught me that um, if I was called to be a preacher, they said, do not stoop so low as to become the president of the United States. And I believe that statement. But then my professor should have stopped there because he said, because the greatest thing, the highest call of man is to preach the gospel. Wrong, friend. The highest call of man is not to preach the gospel, but it's to pray. God did not create Adam and Eve to preach. He, prayed, he created Adam and Eve to spend time with him, to have fellowship with him. And the greatest thing we're going to do today, including our speakers, the greatest thing that Tamara is going to do today is not speak to you today. The greatest thing that she will do today is spend time with Jesus. That's the reason why I always want that to be the very first thing that I do every day, is to spend time with Jesus. Because ministry is not, who you, it's not what you do, but it's who you are. And I, I have a habit that I do every day, and that is always read what I call the proverb of the day, and today's the 11th. And this morning, whenever I was having my time with Jesus, and I was reading through Proverbs 11, I just was astonished at how it seemed to relate so well with today in light of what's happening in Iraq, as well as what we're doing here at this business conference. And so I want to ask all of you, as we open today, I want to ask all of you, if you will, to turn with me to Proverbs 11, if you will, stand with me. And I want us to just enter into the throne room of God. Yesterday, Rich and other speakers so well depicted how the anointing, we carry the anointing with us. But, you know, there, God's with us all the time. It's just our awareness of His presence is not always tuned in. And I want from the very beginning today for us to put our awareness upon Him. Because we're not appointed for business, and we're not annoyed with business. We are anointed for business. We, we are anointed. We need God's anointing. And, and this morning as I was praying for you, I said, Lord, you know, we need the information. And we, we pray that you leave this place with some valuable information that you can take back to your place of business and, and that you can do business more efficiently and more effectively. But more than information, we've got to have his presence. We can say, oh, we are his people to the community, and we can talk about that. But if you know what, if God doesn't burn in our hearts, we're not going to talk about him at the water fountain. We're just not going to. And so what we really need today is not only information, but we've got to have a kiss of God upon our life. Our hearts have got to burn with a passion to know him and to, and to, to be with him and to love him and to exuberate the very presence of God wherever we go. And so, Holy Spirit, Lord, as we look at your word today, may you illuminate your word to our heart. Lord, may it come alive within us as we meditate upon your word and as we set our hearts upon you today. Lord, let the Word of God penetrate our hearts as we meditate upon it and as we begin to enter into your presence, as we begin to become aware of your anointing and your blessing upon our lives. Lord, bless the reading and the, and the meditation of your Word this morning. In Jesus' name, just follow with me, and I just want to read it out loud. I know this is a little different, but the Lord abhors dishonest scales. That accurate weights are his delight. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The righteousness of the blameless makes a straight way for them, but the wicked, Saddam, are brought down by their own wickedness. 
The righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the unfaithful are trapped by evil desires. When a wicked man dies, his hopes perishes. All he expected from his power comes to nothing. The righteous man is rescued from trouble and it comes on the wicked instead. With his mouth, the godless destroy his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous escape. And when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. Boy, have we seen that in the last couple of days. Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. But by the mouth of the wicked, it is destroyed. A man who lacks judgment derides his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his tongue. A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but many advisors make victory sure. He who puts up security for another will surely suffer, but whoever refuses to strike hands and pledge is safe. A kind-hearted woman gains respect, but a ruthless man gains only wealth. A kind man benefits himself, but a cruel man brings trouble on himself. The wicked man earns deceptive wages, but he who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. The truly righteous man attains life, but he who pursues evil goes to his death. The Lord detests men of perverse heart. But he delights in those whose ways are blameless. Be sure of this. The wicked will not go unpunished. But those who are righteous will go free. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. The desire of the righteous ends only in good. But the hope of the wicked only in wrath. One man gives freely yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper, and he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. People curse the man who hoards grain, but blessing crowns him who is willing to sell. He who seeks good finds goodwill, but evil comes to him who searches for it. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. He who brings trouble on his family will inherit only wind, and the fool will be a servant to the wise. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. If the righteous receive their due on earth, how much more the ungodly and the sinner. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we open up our hearts to you today. Lord, I pray, I declare and open heaven over these sanctuaries today. I declare your anointing upon every speaker as he or she speaks. May they speak with authority. May they speak with life. May they speak with truth. May they speak with wisdom, Lord, with truth that will set your people free today. Let your heart word burn within our hearts today. Lord, I ask the anointing of the Holy Spirit invade this place, Lord, that you would sweep across this place. And Lord, that we would not leave here with just knowledge that puffs up, but Lord, that our hearts would burn with a passion for you and a compassion for your people. Lord, let the anointing of the presence of God filtrate this sanctuary today, throughout this day. Let our heart literally burn within us as we sit underneath the anointing teaching of your word and biblical principles as it applies to the business place. Father, in the name of Jesus, have your way. Lord, I lay down all of my preconceived ideas. I ask God, if you want to show up right now, show up, Lord. We'll throw everything out the window. Because, God, we recognize that it's not by our might and it's not by our power, but ultimately it's by your spirit, says the Lord. So, Holy Ghost, have your way. Have your way. Have your way today, I pray. Lord, we'll give you all of the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise. And all of God's people shouted, Amen. Amen. Give Jesus praise this morning. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Woo. It's going to be a great day. Amen. Listen, Margaret Roxbury, where you at, sweetheart? Margaret, where you at? Santa, Margaret, happy birthday, love. One of our students, Vera Sam, happy birthday. I hope you have a blessed day today. Amen. She goes, I can't believe you did that in the conference. That's okay. It's all right. Hallelujah. Uh, we want to get right into our program today, and I want to uh, introduce to you Giffen uh, Simpson. He's going to come and introduce um, Barry Hans who's going to come, and he's going to be sharing a little bit later on in the conference, but we want, just want him to come and address you. So um, Kiffin has been just a tremendous blessing to BRSM and great friend. As a matter of fact, I've been down to Barbados. And he and his family uh, brought my family in and took care of us for a week, and boy, it was a wonderful week, friend. But we so much bless, uh, love Kiffin. Would you make Kiffin welcome this morning? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce a, a very special friend this morning that's going to share with us. He's a, 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 I, th I think he emphasizes a lot on the scripture, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand is doing. He never likes to let people know really uh, what he supports and what he does, but this is a tremendous man, and as the world measures people, I already have to tell you, this is one of the pillars of a very special friend of many of you here. You've heard Reinhard Bonnke. This is one of his strong pillars, and uh, I've had the privilege of going with him to Africa recently, and in just these last series of meetings that Reinhard Bonnke has had in Africa, I think a, a, a million souls will be touched in just this last series alone, giving their hearts to Jesus Christ. And... Uh, I think about uh, 90,000 pastors would have been ministered to, to work with these, uh, these newly saved and converted souls. So it's a tremendous, tremendous ministry that he has got behind. He's, a, a, as I said, a very humble person, and you wouldn't know. So I, I have to tell you, he's one of the greatest developers, I think, that you'd ever come across. I think the last one he's finishing now is about 2,600, 2,800 acres where he's developed his own fire stations, police stations, and he's built a complete city. And it's a, a really most beautiful development. And uh, with this, I without saying much more, I just want to introduce my special friend, Barry Horn, who is a real privilege to come here as a friend, Barry. And I really appreciate you. I know my son does and all the people here for you to make this special effort to share a few words, uh, as I said, which he doesn't usually like to do and uh so it's really lovely to have him here to share with us thank you very much and thank you very God bless thank you, you Kevin. hope you don't mind me not wearing a suit <laughs> when when i was poor i wore a suit every day <laughs> i i can tell my friend Kiffin is, is very poor now because he wears a suit all the time. Uh, I, I want to mainly just sort of give a testimony, and I haven't actually done this in public for, for many years because I feel like I don't have a public ministry. My job in the kingdom of God is to stand behind some of God's servants and hold up their hands. And when I do that, I've done my job. Uh, I'm not to stand before the public. I don't have a public ministry. <clears throat> but I have a ministry that's just as important. Right. We're all supposed to do what we're supposed to do, you know? And when I do what I'm supposed to do, and the public ministries do what they're supposed to do, then it all works, right. you see? And, uh, but I was, uh, I'm 64 years old. I was born in a little town in, in Arkansas, Fort Smith, and uh, of uh, Christian parents raised in the Assembly of God Church, uh, godly parents. And when I was uh, nine years old, uh, the most important thing in my life happened. I was born again at home. Uh, kneeling down with my mother and uh, 
I knew I needed to be saved. Uh, even though I was raised in church, went to church all the time, I knew I wasn't born again. And uh, the Lord entered into my life. And I, I remember when that happened, I wanted Jesus to come back right then. I was ready to go, so let's go. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was a tremendous event. And my father was very involved in giving to, to foreign missions. And very often in Christian families, whatever the parents do, the children follow. Which is not always the case, but very often it is. So very often if, if, uh, if the parents are missionaries, are preachers, uh, the children follow in that. So my parents were very involved in foreign mission giving. So I kind of followed in that. In that. So I, I remember when I was 11 years old, <clears throat> a missionary came to our church from Africa. And we knew this man because he'd been to our church before. And uh, uh, our church had helped this man before. In fact, they had given him a, uh, a vehicle, a, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what it was, it was a station wagon uh, to help in his work. And my father had given him a, a Bell & Howe 16 millimeter projector for showing films. And uh, he stayed in our home. And uh, he had a very um, successful ministry in Africa and had won many people to the Lord in Africa. I don't remember his name, but I knew that he would be giving, uh, taking up an offering. He stayed a week in our church. He'd be taking up an offering uh, to uh, go back to Africa to win more people to the Lord. And I wanted very much to give what I could give at 11 years old. And uh, so I gathered up all the money that I had, and I'd been saving up for a bicycle. And when the call was given at our church to give for this missionary, I, I gave everything that I had, which was about $50. It doesn't sound like very much money, but you could buy a Swin bicycle for 50 bucks. And uh, I gave that, went up to the front and gave that money. And I walked back to my seat. I'm sorry I can't tell this without crying, but God spoke to me as I sat down. And I knew it was God. And the Lord said to me, He said, when you grow up, I'm going to make you a very rich man. And I want you, for the rest of your life, to give and support missions in what we now call third world countries, and to support my servants who are winning the lost on the front line in third world countries. So I knew what I was supposed to do. And that was just as much a call as your pastor has a call to preach the gospel. Just as much a call at 11 years old. Now, I didn't tell anybody about it. I didn't even tell my parents. I didn't know what they would think. Because uh, in that day, um, and in that denomination, at that time, uh, if you were not called to preach or to be a missionary, you were pretty much a second-class Christian. And uh, so I didn't say anything about it, but I knew that I was called to support 
missions. And it was very strong in me. So, uh, I, you know, I went through school. I, I went to college, the University of Tulsa. I graduated in 1960 uh, with a degree in economics. I went on to graduate school uh, in California, University of California. Uh, I, went, I was uh, in the Air National Guard. Uh, they had the draft in, in those days. You guys missed the draft. You know, you just don't know what you missed. Um, I, I was stationed in the uh, Air National Guard for, for active duty in uh, not too far from here in Biloxi, Mississippi and learned uh, to repair radios. And uh, I remember I went home from active duty and I took my parents' television set apart to repair it <laughs> and put it back together and I had a whole basket full of parts left over. <laughs> and that thing never worked again. They had to buy a new television set, but they needed a new television set anyway. So. <laughs> and, uh, but that was not my calling to fix television sets. So. But then I, I went to California, went to graduate school. And, um, but the day came, you know, you can only go to school so long, and finally you have to get a job. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, in 1964, I went at the invitation of my parents to a full gospel businessmen's convention in Phoenix uh, in the winters in January to a convention. And a speaker at that convention was Kenneth Hagan. Have you ever heard of Kenneth Hagan? A great Bible teacher. And I had heard of him, but I never met him. My parents knew him. And uh, one evening after the meeting, we went out to dinner with Kenneth Hagen and his wife, Aretha. And, uh, you know, I was early 20s, I guess, and just got out of graduate school. And we went to dinner sort of next door from the hotel where they were having the meeting. And it was my father, my mother, Kenneth Hagen, Aretha, and myself, those five of us. We sat down at this restaurant, got the menus, opened the menus, and Brother Hagen said to my father, Daryl, he said, Daryl, the spirit of prophecy is coming on me. Let's leave this restaurant and go up to your suite. And so we folded our menu, and I got wide-eyed. I'd never heard prophecy in my life. And we tiptoed out of there and went to my dad's room and sat down. And uh, my father had a uh, big yellow legal pad and he got out his pen and got up this yellow pad and he was going to write down this prophecy. And Brother Hagin started prophesying. And he prophesied in verse. It rhymed. And he prophesied for an hour and 45 minutes. And I'd never heard anything like it in my life. I was very impressed, for one thing. Now, I have a Assembly of God background from Arkansas. And the church I went to was very emotional. And people that spoke in tongues and, and prophesied and had the gifts of the Spirit were very emotional. And I thought that if you weren't emotional, you had the gifts of the Spirit, you just didn't have anything. And Brother Hagin just talked like I'm talking to you in this prophecy, and it rhymed. And that impressed me to no end. Uh, and he would speak a line of prophecy in rhyme, and my father would write it down. Then he'd speak another line, and my father would write it down. This went on for an hour and 45 minutes. And uh, during this whole hour and 45 minutes, there was a sound of a whirlwind outside. And it was incredible, just whirlwind, just 
very loud outside. And when he stopped prophesying, the whirlwind stopped. And he prophesied what was going to happen in the church spiritually and in the economy in America for the next five years. And everything that he prophesied came to pass. One of the things he prophesied was a, a, a famous evangelist was going to die during that five-year period, and the man died. And I won't say who it was, but he died. And uh, what was going to happen economically in the nation, and that all happened. And several other things. We kept the prophecy. Uh, but it was just an incredible situation. And he also went around the room and gave a prophecy uh, of all five people, a personal prophecy, you might say, and I'd never heard that before. And he prophesied to me uh, what was going to happen to me, and that all happened. Um, so it was, it was a, a great um, spiritual experience to me. Uh, and one of the things that he prophesied to me was that that uh, the Lord told me through this prophecy that I was, should take the next opportunity that came about on a job, you know, and that I would be offered a job and I should take it. So very soon after that, I, I looked in the paper in the LA Times and it was, uh, it was a job at a major bank, Security Pacific Bank in Los Angeles. I applied for the job, I was offered the job and I took it. And it was a tremendous opportunity for me because I learned in this job how to be a real estate developer. Uh, the job was uh, um, in the branch location division, uh, finding branch locations for this large bank. And I negotiated uh, with um, uh, we, we, had, we had a group of people who figured out where the bank should put its next branches. And uh, so I would go out and negotiate uh, with shopping center developers uh, for ground leases, shopping center leases, or to buy locations, uh, get the buildings built. Uh, turn over the keys to the branch manager. It was an incredible, it was like getting a PhD in real estate development. And they paid me six, the, the princely sum of $600 a month. And you could live on $600 a month then. So it was, God put me in a tremendous educational job. And uh, during that period of time, uh, Br Brother Hagen came to our church, I, I of course lived in California then, and stayed five weeks teaching, this is in uh, 1965, and was teaching on faith and teaching subjects that I needed to know to be successful in life. And two of the things that he was teaching uh, two subjects. One was right and wrong confession. I was a very negative person. I'd been educated beyond my intelligence. <laughs> and uh, I was a very negative person. And he taught right and wrong confession on how important what we say is. And, uh, you know, I had to straighten up my, my speech. And uh, I, I grabbed a hold of that and changed my confession. And uh, another thing he taught was how to train the human spirit to hear the voice of God, and I certainly needed that. Uh, it was anything that we all need uh, if you're gonna be in business is how to train your human spirit to hear the voice of God. And uh, I got the tapes on those two things and I listened to them over and over and over until I understood it you know, the, the scriptures on those subjects. And uh, those two things changed my life tremendously. And the, uh, during that period of time when I worked for the bank, I bought and sold a three-unit apartment building in a little town called Buena Park 
and made $5,500 in doing what we call a double escrow, where you uh, tie up a piece of property uh, and sell it while it's tied up. And I made $5,500. And on the strength of that, I quit my job at the bank and started Han Development Company. Now, $5,500, you could live a year on that. So uh, I had enough money to live a year, and I struck out as a real estate developer. I wasn't married. If I'd been married, I wouldn't have had the guts to do that. But I could live a year, and I had you know enough money to live a year, so I struck out. Um, and I had learned how to be a real estate developer at the bank, so I had the knowledge. I had enough money to live a year. I had the faith, and I figured I could always, if I failed, I could always go to, back to work for the bank. So it wasn't a crazy thing to do. And uh, I had God's promise. So uh, I struck out. Um, I'll, I could talk a long time on various things that have happened to me. I'll tell you just, just a couple of things. But um, at that time, the freeways were being developed in California. The, the Southern California was growing by leaps and bounds. People were moving in from all over the country, and you know, growth was rampant. And if you're going to be a real estate developer, you've got to go where people are moving in and where the area is growing. And uh, Orange County was growing, so I moved to Orange County. And I knew how to do demographics. I'd learned that at the bank. So I went to several major oil companies who were building service stations along the freeway ramps. And I went to them, I said, look, uh, I know how to do your job. I know how to do the demographics, uh, do the car counts, uh, do the aerial photography. I'll prepare uh, the sites for you. Tell me where you want to go. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do all the write-ups. I'll prepare the package for your management. You can go in and get them approved. I'll just do your work for you. And they liked that because they were all overworked, these real estate reps. And uh, I started doing service station locations. And I didn't have any money. They had all the money. And that worked very well. And I can remember one site I was um, uh, in Fullerton, California. There was a service station location that Shell wanted. And I went to the owner of the site. I knew Shell wanted this site, and the, the owner of it said, said, you know, Barry, you're a nice young man, but I'm going to sell this to, to Shell Oil Company rather than sell it to you uh, because, you know, I know they've got the money. I'm not sure that you can do this deal. And I was very disappointed. I went back to my apartment, and I started praying about it, and I was very disappointed. I, I was just about out of money. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, concerning this business deal, he says, your actions will defeat you or put you over. Your actions will defeat you or put you over. And I was sitting there in my bathrobe, praying. And when he said that to my spirit, I got up and got dressed, got in my car and went back to this owner, walked in his office, and he looked up at me, he said, Barry, I've decided to sell you this site. <laughs> and if I had sat there like a dummy, I would have missed it. But the Lord told me to get up off my duff and go get it. And I bought that site and made, I forgot, Fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, and at the time that was a lot of money. Not bad today. You know. And God just blessed me. I worked hard and I listened to my spirit and just kept growing and growing and growing. 
and and uh, and obeyed the Lord, and I gave as God instructed me, gave to missions, and uh, became wealthy, and uh, gave to missions and grew. I got married, had a family, and I, I got to tell you something that I learned that was negative because this is very important because I've also made a lot of mistakes and who doesn't about 1982 I almost went bankrupt and uh, things had gone well for for years and we had uh, prospered I'd built an awful lot of commercial developments, mainly residential as well. And then beginning about 1980, things started turning south. And I, I remember I'd made one horrible investment. I'd lost, I think, 16 or $17 million on that one investment. And that's back when 16 or $17 million was a lot of money. <laughs> and, uh, and just everything was going south. And I went to the Lord to see what was wrong. And I took a list with me to seek the Lord of, of what we had given over the last year or so. Because I'd given several million dollars. And I had a list of it and I and I and I went. To, to the Lord with this list. I said, Lord, what's wrong? I've, I've obeyed you. Here's a list of what I've given. And I went through this list with him, and I pleaded my case. I learned to do that from Brother Hagin. And I went through this list in prayer, and then I listened. And the Lord said in my spirit, he says, look at that list again. Then I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> and I looked at the list, and he said, now, tell me, what is on that list that I told you to do? And I looked at the list again, and there was nothing on the list that had to do with preaching the gospel in third world countries. Everything on the list was good, but it wasn't what God told me to do. And he said, you've allowed your friends to influence you. And I had. I had, uh, I won't tell you what was on the list, but they were all good things. And I'd made friends of, you know, wonderful ministries. And they had influenced me to give to them. But they were not involved in preaching the gospel in third world countries directly. And I had given to them rather than do what God told me to do. And he said, now, if you'll go back and do what I told you to do, I'll bless you again. And I had to eat crow because I had disobeyed God. It's not enough to give to good things, folks. Come on, right. Come on, right. You got to do what God tells you to do. Yes. And not what your friends tell you to do. Amen. And he said, I'll show you who to give to. Just listen to me. That's good. That's good. Don't listen to your friends. Listen to me. And of course, I asked for forgiveness and apologized. Now, did, did I waste God's money 
I'd given at that on that list was somewhere between two and three million dollars that I'd given. Well, in a way, I had wasted his money in that I'd given to things that he had, didn't tell me to do. And when I analyzed it, a lot of that money was wasted. Absolutely wasted. Because the money was frittered away. And I'm responsible for that. It was his money, it wasn't my money. It wasn't my money. So shortly after that, my wife and I took a trip around the world. You know, if you're going, if you're going broke, you might as well go do something else, you know. use hanging around and uh, Pan American had a special deal where you could go around the world first class for five thousand dollars so we went around the world visiting missions that we knew and new ones that we wanted to get acquainted with and when we got to South Africa we visited um, um, a pastor that we knew well named Ray McCauley in uh, Johannesburg. You ever, you might know about that work? Huge church now. And Ray said, you know, you ought to meet Reinhard Bonnke. Never heard of him. I said, okay, I'd like to meet him. Where is he? He's, Ray says, oh, I'll find out where he is. Well, he was holding a meeting in the a little country just north of South Africa called Botswana. So we rented a little airplane, went to Botswana, a place called Francistown, where he was, where uh, Bonke was holding a meeting. Went to the meeting. We set up on the platform. He was, he was had a tent that would seat about, I think, ten thousand. And uh, the meeting that night, the, the tent was full. There were people hanging around the tent, standing around the tent, several thousand people. Uh, he gave us salvation message. Several thousand people were saved. Uh, a lot of people healed. There were eight totally blind people received their sight. He prayed for people to receive the Holy Spirit and they were slain under the power. Uh, I don't know how many, it's just incredible. Incredible night. And later, Reinhardt apologized to us. He said, you know, it was kind of a slow night last night. Not much happened. <laughs> but we were sitting on the platform watching all of this, and God spoke to my heart. He said, help my servant. He said he would tell me what to do. So I had my instructions. Now that was 20 years ago. 20 years ago. So we started helping Reinhard Bonnke. And uh, that's been a blessing, I'll tell you. Um, I don't know how many million people have been saved in that one ministry in the last 20 years. 25 million would be a good guess. Um, the meeting that, that Ward and Keefan and I went to six weeks ago or so, there were a million, 25,000 people saved. And in the last five months in Nigeria alone, uh, there have been 7.2 million people saved in Bonke's meetings. Things are happening in Africa that uh, are just phenomenal. Uh, 
more people are being saved today than, than ever in the history of the Christian church. And uh, we have a small part in it because God has allowed us to. So I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful. And that's my testimony. You know, I'm as anointed to, to be in business and to have a part in evangelism in third world countries as a preacher is to preach the gospel. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a blessing. Now, I haven't spoken like this in years and years and years because I, I, I don't think I should because I don't want to draw attention to myself. But I want to encourage people to be in business and to get involved in holding up the hands holding up the hands of the people who are winning the lost and supporting financially and with prayer and in every way possible and transportation. I mean, we, one of the things I do is, is transport Oral Roberts to his uh, speaking engagements. He's 85 years old. And he's got a lot to to say a lot to preach, but at 85 years old, he cannot handle the airlines. You know, he just can't handle it. So I take him to his preaching engagements, and I'm blessed to do that. God's given me a plane, and I use it to for those kinds of events. And I'm blessed of God to be able to do that. You know, do all kinds of little things like that. And that's just little bonuses that God allows me to do. I could tell you all kinds of things like that. But they're going to start holding up these signs here pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> so I better quit. But I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you and to meet you. And I'm so glad that we're that we're having this conference and that these kinds of things are being talked about and are being encouraged. And I appreciated the, the brother, your message last night. You know, you're right on, you're right on the top of the, the wave of what needs to be said. Amen. And the man from Argentina, you are too. Amen. Praise God. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, uh, hallelujah. Boy. I can remember when 15 million was a lot of money too. <laughs> you know, Brother Barry, uh, when some people bring pilots, Brother Barry's brought a friend with him. I'd like uh, to introduce him. His name is uh, Keith Garner. And he's the former chief executive of Bombardier. They're the manufacturer of Lear jets and planes and trains. So these are, would you stand and greet the crowd? We'll just welcome you here. If, uh, if any of you all need an airplane, if you just happen to need an airplane today, you just talk with Brother Keith, he'll hook you up. As a matter of fact, they're normally $40 million, but today we have a special. And also there is a founding member of the Full Gospel Businessmen with us today. He, I think he started along with Dima Shakirian. His name is Ralph Littlejohn. Ralph, would you stand and greet the crowd? Hey, thank you for being here today, Brother Ralph. And now, ladies and gentlemen, moving on to our next speaker. Would you please give a roving ovation to Miss is Tamara Lowe.
Thank you. You're very kind. Well, um, I tell you what, one of the blessings of, of being in an event like this is uh, getting to network with others. And so what I'd like you to do real quick, just take one minute, stand up, introduce yourself to somebody here that you have not met. Thank you. Can I give you that maybe? Yeah, that'd be good. Thank you so much. I know when you get started, you don't want to stop. Okay, um, brother, I tell you what. There's not too many things that intimidate me, but please don't show me any signs. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a long-winded person. I'm not a pastor. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking, pastor. I'm just joking. <laughs> that I am from Tampa Bay, home of the Super Bowl winning Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Okay, all right. I just, I just wanted you to know that. <laughs> well, um, hey, I, you know what? I especially want to welcome all of the business women here today. And I, I want to thank the organizers of Anointed for Business for recognizing women in the business place. Um, you know, if you take another look at Proverbs 31, you will find that uh, the Proverbs 31 woman is primarily a businesswoman. Her husband is mentioned only three times, her children are mentioned only once, but her business enterprises are mentioned more than 20 times. She is a textile manufacturer, an importer-exporter, a senior manager, an agricultural supplier and distributor, an entrepreneur, a real estate investor, a land developer, a humanitarian, a philanthropist, and a retailer. She is a CEO, a CFO, and a COO, all rolled up in one impressive package. Ladies and gentlemen, women are also anointed for business. Yeah. Uh, what I'd like to do is to ask all of the ladies who are here, all of the businesswomen, to please stand up. We want to honor you. Now, I want you to remain standing. Stay standing, okay? Don't sit down. Don't sit down. Don't sit down. Ladies, I have a word from God for you, okay? Can I set you free with a liberating word? It's time for you to stop feeling guilty about not homeschooling your kids and cooking them organic cookies, okay? God has equipped you to be who you are. He has. He's given you an anointing. Listen, I, I spent many years of my life wondering why I think like a man. Seriously. You know, and I didn't enjoy ladies' company. I was well into my 30s before I began to appreciate other women because I was just naturally attracted to, to thinking in business terms. But God has blessed you with that gifting. And that is what he has called you to do and be free. Right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind up every jealousy. I bind up every judgment. I bind up every cursed word spoken over you. In the name of Jesus, I speak freedom over you. Freedom over you in the name of Jesus. Blessings to you. I'm going to take your seats. <laughs> well, I, I'm a very unlikely person to be found in business. Um, I grew up in a very troubled home. My father was an alcoholic. Uh, my mother was a, you know, a, a, she was a businesswoman and a very wonderful woman, just liked to smoke pot. <laughs> That's all there is to it. And, um, uh, <laughs> just telling you how it is, calling them like I see them. Uh, I grew up in a party town. I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, when I was 10 years old, I started smoking pot. Very quickly started doing other drugs. And for the next seven years, I was high every single day. Um, I, I did it all. Everything there was to do, I did it. And I didn't know anything, I didn't know anything about Jesus. Um, my my family was Jewish, but you know we never <laughs> we never did anything. We never went any any synagogue, no churches, nothing. The only thing I knew about Jesus was what I accidentally picked up from Christmas carols. 
I knew there was three kings, there was a yonder star, there were some fountains, you know, a manger, whatever that was. That's all I knew. And um, my little brother, one year, on the, on the year of, of my 17th year of life, I had been addicted to drugs for seven years, my little brother gave me a Bible for Christmas one year. And I looked at that and I thought, what a stupid gift. <laughs> you don't give a drug addict a Bible for Christmas, <laughs> you know, you give me drugs. And, um, <laughs> You know, and I thought, well, you know, I know he's going to ask me if I've been reading it. And even in my reprobate state, I figured it's probably not cool to lie about reading the Bible. So I'll read a couple of word sentences. You know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know they were called verses. They had numbers next to them. I didn't know what was going on. But, but uh, you know, as I began to read the Bible... I was in the book of John, I started reading, I thought I'll just read a couple of sentences. Man, I got addicted all over again, you know? I didn't expect to understand it, I thought it would be mind-numbingly boring, but it was fascinating, and when I read about Jesus, I was hooked. And I read through the entire New Testament in like three weeks. Um, at some point, I didn't know you were supposed to pray a prayer of repentance, all my friends were drug addicts, I knew nothing about this stuff, but at some point, I just thought to myself, you know what, I believe it and a miracle happened. The chains were just broken off of me in that moment. All the addictions just dropped off of me in that moment. Praise the Lord. Glory to his holy name. Only to you, Jesus. Only to you, Jesus. Holy God. You know, um, a lot of the students at BRSM have come out of similar situations. They've come out of really horrendous situations, and God has taken them out of the pit and is equipping them to preach the gospel, to go and reach third world countries, to be anointed for business. I mean, look at me. My, my brain cells were fried. I mean, it's amazing I can string two sentences together, you know? Um, but I'll tell you, President Crisco, what God has really put in my spirit is these two words, fathers and benefactors. And I believe, I'm saying this by the Spirit of God, is that God is going to raise up fathers and benefactors from this group to bless this school. I believe that, you know, and God is going to tap you, you know, it's, it's like this brother said, you know, this brother who, who gave his testimony, man, that was worth the price of admission right there. Um, God is going to tap you and he's going to tell you, give to BRSM and do yourself a favor. Be obedient very, very quickly. And I'll tell you something my husband always says is err on the side of generosity. If you're going to err, don't err on the side of stinginess, err on the side of generosity. Well, I brought some pictures of my family as promised to show you. And uh, first of all, I want to show you my very wonderful husband. Can I ask how many of you have ever been to one of our big seminars? Can I see your hands? Okay, quite a few of you. Um, this uh, is not working. There he is. Okay. Peter Lowe. Look at him. Isn't he adorable? I mean, I, listen, I'm telling you what, you can just look at that guy and see the anointing. Can you see that? I mean, this guy is so pure. He is so awesome. I love him so much. What a man of God. Um, he also said to give you his greetings. Um, you know, I often say my husband greets you, and that's just to be polite because he really didn't greet you, but he really did send greetings to you. He wanted to be here. Um, I want to show you my, my boys. Uh, this is my boy, Zach. He's nine years old. He's a preacher. His mama taught him how to preach, and he preaches really good. He's only got one sermon. It's 20 minutes long, but I'm telling you what, everybody in your church will get saved. <laughs> This is my, Bla my boy Blaze. He's four. Isn't <laughs> he cute? And this is my boy Warren Sapp, number 99 of the Super Bowl winning Tampa Bay Buccaneers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. You know what I love about football? Football teaches us so much about life and so much about business. And one thing I've learned about football is that the score doesn't count at halftime. It doesn't count at halftime. It's where you are at the end of the game that matters. Now, I do feel obligated to tell you that this year, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were ahead at halftime, okay? <laughs> but, you know, um, I live my life by, by what I call a thousand-year budget, the thousand-year budget. And what that is is what's going to count a thousand years from now? You know, because if it's not going to count in eternity, if it's not going to count a thousand years from now, I'm not going to be giving my blood, sweat, and tears to it. And you know what? That is a, a, a great overall mindset to think when you're making decisions, is this going to count a thousand years from now? Amen. 
Um, well, you know, I have had the privilege of working with the world's greatest leaders. I've shared the platform with a lot of U.S. presidents. I've been mentored by the greatest business leaders, Super Bowl winning coaches and quarterbacks. And um, I've heard the greatest speakers in the world speak on leadership. And I want to tell you something. A lot of, of that stuff is just junk, you know? It's a lot of self-centered, self-serving, self-aggrandizing garbage. And um, the thing that, that God is saying is that we can't buy into the world's philosophy on leadership, you know? Um, the Lord gave me something to give to you, and it's four leadership mandates. If you're, if you're taking notes, I'm going to move real fast. It's four leadership mandates. When God gave me this, I looked at this list, and I thought, these are the four most important things I know about leadership. And then I looked at the list again, and I said, you know what? These are the four most important things I know about life. These are mission critical. They're non-negotiable. You absolutely must do these four things. Leadership mandate number one, you will be broken. You will be broken. For you to be a great leader or even an average Christian, you are going to have to master the art of surrender to God. The two greatest powers in the universe are both trying to kill you. <laughs> That's why Paul said, I die daily. I die daily. And you know the devil's out to kill you. <laughs> you got to learn how to surrender to one and resist the other. But either way, friend, you will die. You are a dead man walking. Every person powerfully used in scripture was broken, and you will be broken too. The world's teaching on leadership is how to fix a company, how to fix a department, how to fix others, how to fix yourself. The Lord's teaching on leadership is how to break your will, how to break your ambition, how to break your pride. Every person in scripture who was powerfully used of God was first broken by God. 2 Timothy 3.12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Everyone, 1 Peter 4, 12, dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. This is normal Christian life, folks. You will be maligned. You will be falsely accused. You'll be mistreated. You'll lose your reputation. You'll be severely tested in finances. God will hammer selfish ambition right out of you. You'll be corrected and corrected and corrected and corrected until you think that you can do nothing right, and then you'll be broken enough for God to use you as a true leader. If it hasn't happened yet, trust me, it will. <laughs> I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it will happen, okay? And just remember, I told you it was coming, all right? Leadership mandate number two, you will be a warrior. Every morning, that you wake up every morning that your eyes open, you woke up in a foxhole. God did not call us to a playground. He called us to a battleground. I, I don't know what it is with me. Maybe, maybe I've just got a bad attitude, but I, I have a warrior spirit. I don't take a lot of crap from the devil, and I, and I choose my words carefully, kids. <laughs> um, <laughs> man, I'm going to tell you something. You know what I do first thing in the morning? first thing in the morning. Sometimes I don't even get out of bed to do it. Sometimes I dress in bed. I put on the full armor of God first thing in the morning. I, I put the blood of Jesus over myself and my whole family, spirit, soul, and body. And here's what I did. You know, one day I started thinking about this, and I thought, you know, uh, some people say, you know, oh, we just put on the full armor of God. But I thought about it. You know, armor is some heavy stuff. You know, it, it takes more time to put on armor than it does to brush your teeth, you know? So I, I think this just came right out of heaven because I just started praying this way and I pray this way every day of my life. I say I put on the helmet of salvation and I command every thought of doubt and unbelief to bounce off of it. I put on the breastplate of righteousness, not my righteousness, but the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I buckle around me the belt of truth and I prohibit every lie of the enemy from entering my life. I take up the shield of faith to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I take up the sword of the spirit to inflict the vengeance of my God on all his enemies. I put on eagerness to share the gospel of peace as my shoes. I wrap the zeal of the Lord around me like a cloak. I am strong in the Lord and yes. in his mighty power I stand firm going from victory to victory to victory yes. to victory in Christ. Yes. And then you know what I do? Then I bind up 
every opposition to me. I bind up word curses, I bind up jealousies, I bind up judgments, I bind up all attacks of the evil one, I bind up demonic forces, I bind it up over our offices, over our employees. I break word curses, I bind up all attacks of witchcraft. And then I loose the blessing and favor of God over our lives. I loose it over our lives and I do that every day. I do it every single day and you know what friend? You need to do that too. You need to do it too. That's better than weedy, son. That'll get you going. All right. Is this working yet? Yeah. Okay. Jesus said, Do not suppose that I have come, peace to, come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. He said, The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Now i got a question for you. Why do Christians live in defeat? If God has given us all this authority, why do Christians live in defeat? Two reasons. Number one, they are in sin. Plain and simple. They are in sin. And number two, they don't fight. <laughs> well, i got a little news flash for you. Refusing to fight does not make you exempt from the battle. It makes you an easy target. In layman's terms, it makes you dead. <laughs> I got a little memory verse for you. Everybody stand up to memorize the Word of God. Praise your name, Jesus. This is a lifetime verse for you. Everybody repeat after me. Ecclesiastes 8.8. 8. Yes, there is no discharge from the battle. Ecclesiastes 8.8. There is no discharge from the battle. Repeat. You may take your seats, troops. <laughs> well, you know, I started studying military warfare when I was a year old in the Lord. I was 18 years old, and I started studying war. Um, why? Because I realized early on, this is war. It's war. And um, uh, there is um, a very interesting thing in military warfare. It's called PSYOPs. And it's actually a contraction. It stands for psychological operations. I find this very fascinating because this is what the devil is doing to us all the time. And we need to get a clue. <laughs> um, you might recognize this lady here. You might not. This is Tokyo Rose. This is one way that PSYOPs operates. It's, um, this lady was, was very famous during World War II. They would play music, the, the Japanese would play music that the, the GIs like to listen to. And in between, she would come on and say, you going home in a body bag, your wife no love you, your wife sleeping with other men, you know. And, and it was just designed to demoralize. Um, here's another, another way that PSYOPs is used. This is going on right now. You'll see, let's see, do I have a... I have a, no, I guess I have no laser pointer here, or I don't see it. Okay, if you look up on top of that, this is a high-mobility, mov, high multi-purpose wheeled vehicle, otherwise known as a Humvee. And what they do is they put loudspeakers on top of them, and they might just have one or two Humvees and maybe a tank and, and a few guys, but they are just blaring out the sounds of war, helicopters and explosions and screaming, and it just makes it sound like, like a big, huge army. It's to psych the enemy out. Do you see that the devil is always doing that to us, just trying to psych us out with stupid stuff? <laughs> All right, psychological warfare. It's designed to intimidate, to encourage surrender, to demoralize, to cause division, to undermine leadership. This is what the devil is doing to you all the time. That is why the Bible says, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The most interesting part of PSYOPs, I think, is propaganda leaflets. And what this is is... Uh, uh, leaflets that are dropped by helicopter or aircraft, it's been a standard psychological warfare strategy since World War II, it was actually developed in the late 1800s before they even had aircraft carriers to drop these things with, they did it by helium balloon. And I want to show you some of these. Um, these are kind of hard to look at, but I think it's important for you to realize because of its application to spiritual warfare. This is one that was used in the Vietnam War, and here you see um, a soldier kind of hurt on the field there, and then the next picture is, is pretty nurses taking care of a, a guy in the hospital. And it basically says, surrender, and we're going to treat you nice. Now, you know what? The devil's telling you that. The devil's oh. telling you, surrender, and we're going to treat you nice. <laughs> you know? It's a lie. It's a lie. 
This is the mighty B-52. You have now experienced the terrible rain of death and destruction its bombs have caused. Your area will be struck again and again, but you will not know when or where. They will rain death upon you again without warning. So what would happen is the B-52 would come by, bomb a site right on its tail. These leaflets would be dropped. Undermine the enemy. Discourage the enemy. Oh, you are a good man. Look at that. Me and you guys at Brownsville have your act together. All right. Uh, killed in action, you are next. This one's a little hard to look at. This is another one from Vietnam. Here you see a young Viet Cong officer before and after his death. Desert Storm. Here's a mother and a father, and they're looking kind of worried. They, they see their, you know, an imaginary picture of their son lying bloody on the battlefield. The caption reads, Oh, my dear son, when will you come home? Afghanistan. Uh, here you see a missile coming into the cave with the Al-Qaeda inside, and it says, Al-Qaeda, do you think you're safe? On the back it says, in your tomb. Just psyching out the enemy. You want to see something they're using in Iraq? Here you see a, a soldier looking kind of pensive in the middle as presumably a dead soldier, and then you see kind of like an exodus. The caption read, reads, do not risk your life and the lives of your comrades. Leave now, go home, watch your children, learn, grow, and prosper. Now last night, Rich Marshall referred to, to this scripture, Revelation 1-6. He has made us kings and priests. I want to tell you something, kings. Um, we're going to be judged. We're going to be judged. Um, this is something I think that's really, really important for us to hear because I think that there is a lot of misunderstanding in terms of what is expected of us as business people, as those who are anointed for business. We are kings. And did you know that all the kings are judged on two things? If you look in the Old Testament, you will find that every king in the Old Testament, every king of Israel, every king of Judah, was judged on two things. Every single one. They had an epitaph written by the hand of God. And here's what they are judged on, and pay attention because you will be judged on this too. Number one is, did they walk in the ways of the Lord? Did they walk in the ways of the Lord? And you know, uh, I think most born-again Christians kind of believe that if they walk in the ways of the Lord, that that's enough, that that's good enough. If we just keep our hands clean, if we just, you know, keep our nose clean for the next 70 years, that's good. It's not enough. God's going to judge you on something else. Did they remove the high places? That's the second thing that they were judged on. Did they remove the high places? You know, uh, if you were here on Wednesday, you heard Pastor Kilpatrick talk about how when that statue of, of Saddam was pulled down, that the enemy retreated. You know, we have got to be pulling down the high places. Number one in our own lives. We can't allow high places of idolatry to exist in our own lives. And secondly is we have authority in the realm that we've been given. As kings of, of our kingdom, we have authority to pull down the high places. And I'm telling you what, if you don't do it, Honey, you're in, you're in for a world of hurt because the devil will absolutely trample over you. You have got to apprehend your kingly authority. Now listen, we are talking about um, leadership. Hmm. Do we have a handheld? Do we have a handheld mic I could use? We're talking about leadership, and um, I have some questions for you. Is this one on? Okay. All right. Stand up, Summer. This is Summer Cotton Wright. She's a BRSM graduate. She was with me for two years as my nanny. She now works in our, in our ministry. And um, so I'm going to start with you, Summer. <laughs> she doesn't know I'm doing this. <laughs> okay, Summer. Would you consider Jesus a good leader? Definitely. Okay, give her a round of applause because she answered well. She answered well. She answered well. All right, all right, all right. I got another question here. Now, Brother, you were, you were the one they introduced as, as one of the founders of Full Gospel Businessmen. Thank you for being here. We I'm honor you. The early, early stages of Full Gospel. That is awesome. That is awesome. So I'm going to ask you the next question. Now, would you consider Jesus Christ was the greatest leader who ever lived? Very definitely. Yes. Amen. Give him a round of applause because he's right. He got the answer right. He got the answer right. Okay. You ladies are so cute. We need to hear from one of you ladies. No, <laughs> you're pointing to you. Okay. All right. Now, as the greatest leader who ever lived, do you think that it would be good for Christians to model the leadership of Jesus Christ? Definitely. Absolutely. Give her a round of applause because she got it right. She got it right. She got it right. 
But now, you know, I got I to gotta pick on my favorite pastor. You know, I love you so much. I love this church so much that you're really smart. I know you know the answer to this question. Because <laughs> now I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you the tough question. The tough question is, as the greatest leader who ever lived, where did Jesus lead people? Where did he lead them? Where did he lead them? Oh, man, he's a preacher. I should have done this. <laughs> Or did he lead them to his father? Yeah, he led them to the father, didn't he? Thank you, Pastor. Um, <laughs> you know, we talk about leadership so much, um, and we want to lead like Jesus. Leadership mandate number three, you will evangelize. You will evangelize. <laughs> if you had the cure to cancer, would you lock it up in a safe? You got something better than the cure to cancer. <laughs> Most Christian business leaders, they want to share their faith, but they just don't know how. And what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is just kind of give you some keys of practical ways that you can share your faith in the marketplace. You know, when I first got saved, I thought every Christian talked about Jesus. I thought everybody was leading people to the Lord. And, and uh I, I got involved in a great church soon after I got saved, and I moved into the home of a Christian family. And every day I would come home, and, and I would say, man, it was so awesome today. I met this lady on the bus, and I led her to the Lord. And then, you know, at work today, I, you know, I talked to this guy about Jesus, and he's accepted Christ, and he's coming to church this week. And, you know, I mean, like, that was just the way it was every day. I came home, you know, leading people to Christ and telling them the testimony. I was excited about it, and, and I thought everybody was like that. And then one day, um, Joan and Bill, my, my parents that I lived with, my house parents, um, they called me aside, and they were very serious. And they said to me, now sit down, we need to talk to you. And I thought, oh my, what have I done wrong? And they said, you know what, that's not the way you do it. And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, you're, you're leading people to Christ based on your powers of persuasion. You're a good salesperson, and you're just selling people on Jesus, and that's not the way you do it. And I thought, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm to be in to submission to these people, so, okay, tell me how you're supposed to do it. And they said, well, what you're supposed to do is you're just supposed to model a Christian life and be a good person and radiate the love of God, and then eventually... People will come to you and say you're different and what's different about you and then and then you can share your testimony. And I said, okay, well, just out of curiosity, how many people have you led to the Lord like this in the past year? And they went silent. <laughs> and it was because in the two years I lived with them, they never led one person to the Lord, you know? And I was just like, well, you know what? I like the way I'm doing it wrong better than the way you're doing it right, you know? <laughs> But that, that planted a bad seed in me. It really planted a bad seed in me. And over the next 10 years, I became very intimidated about sharing Christ. And I wouldn't even share my testimony unless I was asked to share my testimony. And then, um, oh, I don't know, it was about four years ago, I was in this place. And um, I had come for a conference, like you guys are here for a conference. And um, somebody was speaking on the platform, I can't remember who, but, but as I was sitting there, the Holy Spirit suddenly said to me, he said, I'm going to tell you the secret of jumpstarting your spiritual life. And I said, whoa, all right. And I took out my pen and my notebook and I wrote, the secret of jumpstarting your spiritual life, colon, download, Lord, I'm ready. And, and, and here's what he said. He said, do something radical totally outside of your comfort zone for me. And as soon as the Lord said that to me, I knew what it was. And it, and it was witnessing, you know, because I had become very inhibited in that area of my life. The wells had been plugged up. And so, on the way home, we were staying at the Hampton Inn, um, my friend and I, and uh, on the way back, there was an accident on the bridge going out there to the beach, and, and the traffic was stopped in both directions. And... Um, and so we just sat there for a second, and I looked over at my friend, and I said, you know what? This is an awesome witnessing opportunity. And I sounded very confident, but my heart was like, you know, I was, I was nervous. And I said, come on, let's go share the gospel. And so we get out of the car, traffic stop. We walk down to the front. There was a car upside down, and, and there was a girl trapped inside, and, and she didn't look like she was going to make it. And um, 
We walked back down probably about 30 cars back to our car. Every single person we stopped and witnessed to him. And one boy got saved there on that bridge. And uh, the next day, uh, we were driving through a Taco Bell. <laughs> Or was it a Burger King? These, these details are relevant. No, it was a Taco Bell. Okay, and so we get up there. I, I don't even remember the verse of scripture I quoted to the girl. I quoted the girl who was handing me my change, a, a verse of scripture, and then I said to her, do you know what that means? That means that, that whatever you have done, Jesus will forgive you, and he will come in and make you a new person. He'll change your life. And this girl teared up. She got tears in her eyes, and she said, I've done a lot of bad things. And I said, honey, it doesn't matter. Do you want to be born again? And she said, yes, I do. Hanging out of the window of the Taco Bell, she takes my hand, and I led her to the Lord. And, and then I thought, hey, we're on a roll. So we went to go get gas, and I stopped, and I, there was a guy pumping gas. I asked him for directions, and, and so he gave them to me. And I said, you know what? You gave me directions. Now I want to give you some directions. And, I, you know, I shared, shared Christ with him, and, and he got saved. And, you know, the greatest evangelist of our time, I really believe he's, he's the greatest evangelist of our time, he says, you can witness to people by the smile on your face. And I, I hate to disagree with a man of God like that, but I'm telling you what, there's nobody in this room that got saved simply because somebody smiled at you. You have got to use words. You know, I mean, I love this man. I respect him so much. I don't even want to tell you his name. I'll just say that it starts with B and ends in Illy Graham. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, if you can witness with your lifestyle, if you can witness with your lifestyle, then why did Jesus use words? You know? I mean, he had the perfect lifestyle. He wouldn't have needed to say a thing. And yet, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, and we need to do that. So what I want to do is give you, um, very quickly, five ways. They're very effective. Five ways to share your faith in the marketplace. These get results. This works, okay? Um, number one is compose your testimony. Compose your testimony. It's a very, very simple thing to do to compose your testimony. You describe your life, first of all, before Christ. Describe your life before Christ. Now, what I want you to do is write down two things about yourself the way you were before Christ, okay? Do that right now. Two things. You know, you know not, not rocket science here. You know, I was on drugs, I was miserable, or whatever it was, okay? All right. Secondly, describe how you came to Christ. You can just write down one word for this. You know how you came to Christ. Third, describe your change after Christ. Describe how you changed after Christ. Write down two or three words for this. You know, I got delivered from, from drugs. I felt so free. I had meaning and purpose in my life. Okay? Now, in just a minute, I'm going to have you turn to the person next to you, and you're going you're gonna to share your testimony with them. Very briefly, this is, this is like a 30-second exercise, okay? And, and you need to be prepared, instant, in season and out, to give your testimony, right? So this is a good thing to do. But I want to tell you, don't be nervous about this. If you've never done this before, you can't go wrong. This is a no-brainer. It's very, very easy. Um, my father-in-law is a preacher, and he has a friend, he's a Canadian preacher, and he has a friend that, that was asked to go to Quebec and, and speak at a church. And this guy thought, well, you know, I studied French in school, I, I can preach in French. And so um, he went, he wanted to share his testimony with the, with the congregation, quite a large congregation. And he said to them, he was using this format, you know, the before, how you came to Christ, and the after. And he said, I want to show you my past. But what he said in French was, I want to show you my bum. I want to show you my bottom. And the whole crowd started laughing. He couldn't figure out what he said, but he thought, you know, I'm just going to press on. And so he said, and you'll see, when I show you my past, you'll see that there are, and he was saying bottom. When I show you my bottom, you'll see that there are very two distinct parts to it. <laughs> With a clear line of separation in the middle. <laughs> You can't do any worse than that, all right? All right, I want you to turn to the person next to you. I want you to share your testimony right now, how you were before Christ, how you came to Christ, how, how you changed after Christ, okay? We're just going to take 30 seconds to do this. Okay, now your partner should be giving their testimony to you. Other partner now.
Praise the Lord. Glory. All right. All right. Did your partner get saved? Okay. I'm going to pull Pastor Kilpatrick on you. Everybody look this way. Look this way. All right. So that's real easy and it's real fun. I have so much fun witnessing. You guys, this is not a heavy thing. This is an easy thing. It's an easy and fun thing. All right. Second way to witness, number two, is use tracks. Now, I'm not a big fan of tracks normally. I think of this as like the, the you know, witnessing for wimps, like the lowest form of evangelism. But um, I do want to recommend to you the American Track Society. And you'll see, here's one they just came out with. You know, we were seeing this on the news, the, you know, readiness or terrorism levels, right? We all saw that on CNN. I mean, the next day, this track was printed and ready to go. And these things get read because they're really relevant. Um, now, this I recommend that everybody do. Create your own track. This is my track. Hi, I'm Tamara. This is my story. I, I just print it up on my laser printer. Man, I hand this thing out everywhere I go. People read this. They get saved. They want to talk to you about it. Everybody should do this. Very simple, easy thing to do. All right? Number three is language. We know in business we all need language techniques, particularly salespeople. How many salespeople do we have here? Yeah, quite a lot of salespeople. We need the language techniques. We need to know what to say. So I want to give you a couple of quick things that, that I use um, when I witness. One is, are you very interested in spiritual things? Are you very interested in spiritual things? The beauty of this question is it really doesn't matter how they answer it. If they say yes, you say, well, that's great. Let me tell you about something that happened to me. Boom, launch into your testimony. If they say no, then you say, you know, I wasn't very interested in spiritual things at one time. But then, boom, launch into your testimony. Doesn't matter what they say. OK? Um, here's one. I really feel in my heart that I need to share some good news with you. Is that OK? Would you like to hear some good news? Nobody's going to tell you no about this. Everybody likes to hear good news. Right into your testimony. Now, I, I'm kind of straightforward, so I, I oftentimes will just say, has anybody ever told you about Jesus? I mean, not the religious stuff, but how Jesus Christ can absolutely change your life. You know, I have a friend, uh, this guy, he just recently got in a taxi in New York City. He had to share a taxi. It was a, a terrible day, very snowy. Got in with four other people and the taxi driver. So here they are. I mean, they were packed in, and the traffic was slow, and he, he's a preacher. And so he said to him, he goes, now look, he goes, I'm tired, I, I, you know, I'm just not going to waste time. All of you here are going to get saved, so who wants to go first? <laughs> and, and the taxi driver, he goes, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. As soon as you got in this car, I knew you were a Christian. And then one guy goes, okay, I'll get saved first. <laughs> He prays the sinner's prayer with my friend, and then, and then he gets on the phone and he goes, Hey, hon, I'm in a taxi. We're all getting saved, you know. <laughs> all right. Close the sale. Close the sale. Um, Jim Elliott, the, the great uh, missionary and martyr, said this. He said, Lord, make me a fork in the road so that when people meet me, they will have to decide about Christ. You know, a lot of people are content to be a signpost pointing the way to God. I'm not content to be a signpost. I want to be a fork in the road. When you meet me, you're going to have to decide one way or another, okay? Um, how do you close the sale? Well, here's, here's one way, and I like this way because, man, it gets the witness out real quick. Have you ever made the wonderful discovery of knowing Jesus Christ personally? I got this from Campus Crusade for Christ. Have you ever made the wonderful discovery of knowing Jesus Christ personally? I bet you'd like to, wouldn't you? Now, I saw that, and I thought, you know, that seems a little hokey, but I'm going to try it. First person I walked up to and said this, have you ever made the wonderful discovery of knowing Jesus Christ personally? They said, no, I don't think I have. I said, I bet you'd like to, wouldn't you? And they said, yes, I would. And I was like, you would? <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, it, it, sounds, it sounds hokey, but I'm telling you what, man, it works. There's, there's a kid at the Publix that I have, Publix, I don't, you, you guys probably don't have these, but, but in Florida we have Publix supermarkets. That's where I go shopping, one right down the street from my house. There's a, there's a bag boy in Publix. I'm telling you what, every time I go shopping there, that kid runs runs up to me, hugs me, tells me he's reading his Bible, he's active in church, because one day when he was carrying my bags out to the car, I said to him, have you ever made the wonderful discovery of knowing Jesus Christ personally? I bet you'd like to, wouldn't you? He, he said, yes, I would. And he got saved. I mean, like, it's, there's nothing to it. This is easy stuff, and you can do it. Um, can you bring me those Evangel cubes? I want to show you something. I, 
I don't, I don't know who produced these things, but I believe that this is the greatest witnessing tool that has ever been developed. The amazing Avanja Cube. You guys need to get yourselves one of these. I gave this to a guy, um, very, very quiet, mild-mannered guy uh, at my church, a businessman, but really had a heart to reach the lost. And so I gave him one of these things. And uh, um, what it is, it's like a little Rubik's Cube puzzle, okay? And you can go through the, I'm telling you, a child can use this. My child has used this. My first grader won three kids to the Lord. He took this in one day. Won three kids to the Lord at his school. All you do is you tell the little story. It's, it's self-explanatory. I mean, it's got arrows. You don't even need to know what to do. Okay, so, you know, it's just, this is every man separated from a holy God by sin, and then you open it up like this, and it shows Jesus on the cross. But Jesus paid the price for our sins so that we would and have to pay the price and then it opens up this way and he died and was buried in a tomb that was guarded by two soldiers and then it opens up this way but but death had no hold on him and he came back again now when I share it I, I like to go yeah I thought I was gone but boom no I'm back <laughs> <laughs> then uh, you know, now you have a choice to make. You can reach out to a holy and loving God who wants to help you heal you forgive you of all your sins and sicknesses um, or you can go to hell, basically, you know. <laughs> but the choice is up to you. It's a good choice. Come to Jesus. He loves you. And then, uh, you know, you pray with him to receive Christ. And then on the back here, it's got a little Bible. It tells you, you know, a little follow-up. Now read your Bible. Guy praying, you know, talk to Jesus every day. He loves you. Uh, hands holding each other. Fellowship. Get involved in a local church. And share your faith. This is an icon of a, a cross on the world. Um, it's, it's a great tool. And so I asked my friend one time, I said, you know, uh, I gave you that Evangel Cube. Did you ever use that thing? And he goes, you know what, Tamara? He said, I set that on my desk. And people just come in and they pick it up. And I say to them, you want me to show you how that works? And he goes through. He's led three people to Christ at his job just by setting this thing on the desk. Who wants this? Does anybody want this? Yeah? You want it. I saw it. Yeah. Oh, Give it to that lady there because I saw her first. Okay, um, now I want, I want to give this one to somebody. I know you guys are so enthusiastic. I want somebody who uh, really is inspired now to share their faith, but it's outside your comfort zone. You want to jumpstart your spiritual life. Pretty lady, pretty lady, come. Blondie, yes, you. You're cute. <laughs> All right, this is for you, hon. All right, leadership mandate number four. Leadership mandate number four. You will fast and pray. You will fast and pray. If you really want to hear from God, the best way to do it is fasting and prayer. Um, <laughs> God called me about two years ago to do a 21-day fast. And I, I don't know about you, maybe you just cruise right on through fasting, you have no problem with it, but for me, whenever God has called me to fast over the past 20 years of my Christian experience, I would hear the word fast and I'd start getting weak, you know? <laughs> I mean, and then, you know, I would do it by obedience, but I was so miserable, you know, I could barely turn the pages of my Bible, I'm weak and cranky, I'm, I don't want to talk to God because I'm mad at Him for making me fast, and, you know, and so I thought, you know, God calls me to this 21 day fast, and I thought, I am going to die, you know? <laughs> and so um, it was, God was opening up a lot of doors for me in ministry at that time. I was traveling internationally a lot, and, and I knew it wasn't the time, but, but I spent probably five months researching, and I consulted the top medical doctors um, in the world, in, in the realm of fasting, in the field of fasting. And I found out um, some things that I never found out by reading Christian books. You know, the, the information is just not readily available out there. But I'm telling you what, this fast changed my life. It changed my life. I mean, I came out with a greater intimacy with God, with greater spiritual authority than I've ever known in my life. Um, and it cured me of fasting fear forever. Like now, it's, it's just a regular part of my life. Like when God calls me to fast, I feel so good about it. I'm so happy about it. I went through the whole fast. I had energy the whole time. I felt great the whole time. Um, an additional side benefit is that, that I lost 15 pounds. I never gained it back. Um, my cholesterol dropped 52 points. My doctor was amazed. I mean, like, it's good. It's a blessing. It's good for you. Um, do you know what Ramadan is? 
Do you know what Ramadan is? It's when one billion Muslims fast for a whole month. Their kids fast, the old people fast, everybody fast. Can you imagine the force of ungodliness that that unleashes in the earth? It's time for God's people to start out sacrificing the world, you know? Why aren't God's people fasting? I believe there's three reasons. Number one is they're not hungry. They're not spiritually hungry. And that's one thing that, that fasting will do for you is it'll make you spiritually hungry. You will become spiritually hungry. Number two, they don't have the proper uh, um, information. I, I've got every book in print and quite a few that, that are not in print anymore on fasting and I have not seen the technical information on fasting that the experts gave me. So they don't have the, the proper information. Number three is they have a wrong view of fasting. They think it's supposed to be unpleasant. Christians think that fasting is supposed to be unpleasant. It's not supposed to be unpleasant. Jesus said, um, when you fast, don't do it like the hypocrites do because they put on a miserable face to show everybody that they're fasting. Well, you know, hypocrite, it means falseness hypocrisy, it's falseness. Even the hypocrites aren't unhappy about fasting, they're pretending to be unhappy about it. You know, that's why it's false, right? So, um, you know, when I started doing fasting workshops, I've been doing, doing quite a lot of that, um, I thought, you know what, I want it to be fun. I want it to be fun for people. Like, I want to communicate what a joy it is, what a blessing it is to fast. And so I went on the internet and uh, I thought, I'm going to look up, I'm going to find some fasting jokes. Do you know, friend, there is not one fasting joke on the entire World Wide Web. I, I mean, if I looked up some, you know, Maltese cat from Sri Lanka or something, I'd have 10,000 hits, not one hit for fasting and jokes. But being the persistent person I am, I kept at it. I finally found the only joke on the Internet about fasting and prayer. It's, it's well, it's kind of, would you like to hear it? Yeah. All right, it's, it's, it's kind of it's kind of dumb, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it with you anyway, okay? All right, a priest and a rabbi were talking about fasting and prayer. And the priest said to the rabbi, you know, Mahatma Gandhi used to fast for months at a time, which caused him to lose a lot of weight, and he became quite frail. And I don't know if you know this, uh, the priest continued, but, but fasting also causes bad breath. In spite of all of this, Gandhi still walked hundreds of miles completely barefoot, which caused him to develop hard calluses on his feet. The rabbi paused for a moment and then said, so what you're saying is Gandhi was a super calloused, fragile mystic plagued with halitosis. <laughs> I told you it was kind of dumb, I warned you. <laughs> All right, um, I want to share with you something that, that God put on my heart um, to do. This is my, my little part for world missions and evangelism. I want to say to you, I'm going to tell you about some, some fasting manuals that I've written. Um, I want to say to you that I'm very blessed. My job pays me very well. I don't receive a penny of this, not a penny of it. I did it, number one, because I got tired of telling people what I had done. Because when I, when I did this, I mean, my whole body transformed. I transformed spiritually. And everybody I knew was coming up to me saying, what have you done? And I kind of got tired of repeating myself. <laughs> that was one thing. But, and then, you know, I produced these manuals. And they have, they've only been out for like a year and a half. They've gone all over the world. I think they're like in 11 different countries now every day. I get testimonies um, on the internet, people writing to me, telling me uh, how God has really transformed their lives through it. Um, the first one I wrote is called Fasting and Prayer, Experiencing the Power and Presence of God. And um, this one gives you 21 spiritual and physical benefits of fasting, a detailed explanation of four levels of fasting, how, exactly how to transition into and how to transition out of a fast, the best vitamins to take while fasting. Um, a vegetable broth that you can have while you're fasting that has, it's, the recipe is in here, it's the exact vitamins and minerals that you need while fasting. Um, there's a, a guideline, a 40-day guideline for prayer and fasting. This is what God gave me when I was fasting the first time that I did the extended fast. I mean, there's questions in here. I mean, these things will pierce your heart. Um, for instance, um, is there any sin in your life? If you don't think there's any sin in your life, you need to fast and pray, okay? Because the Holy Spirit will show you some stuff you don't want to see, but you need to. Um, when was the last time you led someone to the Lord? How can you improve your witness? Um, who have you been critical of? 
Who have you been critical of? Write down exactly what you've said and then repent of it. I mean, like, these are soul-searching questions in here. Um, the second one that, that I wrote was kind of a follow-up. This one is called Eating and Drinking for the Glory of God. You know, the Bible says whatever you do, whether it's eating or drinking, do it all for the glory of God. But we don't. We don't eat and drink for the glory of God. We eat whatever we want, whenever we want, as much as we want. Um, and these are things that the Lord spoke to me um, that really has changed my life. You know, uh, years ago the Lord said to me, I want my people to learn how to live a fasted lifestyle. And I thought that was a kind of cool phrase, a fasted lifestyle, but I had no idea what it meant. This, this is not dieting. Dieting is bondage, in my opinion. I think dieting is of the devil, quite honestly, I do. <laughs> so, but this is a zero bondage approach to weight management and health, and this is an important thing. You know, one of my mentors is, is T.L. Osborne, and this guy, I mean, he's, he's in his late 70s, his body moves like a 40-year-old. And you know why? It's because when he was around 50 years old, he started seeing all of his friends getting sick and dying, and he thought, I'm not going to do that. And he started working out. He works out six days a week. The man is, is inspiring, but it's because he's made some very simple little, little changes that, that he incorporated into his life that has extended his longevity and has extended his ministry. I really believe that. Um, the last one I wrote is, is the fasting journal, and this one I wrote um, with a friend. It was I, I wrote a letter to my friend every day and emailed it to her. She'd never done an extended fast before, and she wanted to, and I told her, I'll, I'll fast with you. And um, so we did a 20-day fast together, and uh, this is the result of it. Um, every day there's, there's the letter that I sent, and this answers questions that come up in the course of fasting. Um, it's, it's, what it is designed to do is to give you the experience of fasting with a friend and a mentor. And then on this page you have journal notes, you have a checklist of exactly what you need to do to do an intelligent fast. It's medically sound. Um, so anyway, um, the manuals are $25 each. You can get all three of them for $60. I um, brought along some of Cubes too, if you'd like to get those. Those are $9. Again, everything goes, goes to missions and evangelism. Now, I just did a leadership conference at ORU. In fact, I wanted to share this testimony with you. I got some good news for you kids. Um, <laughs> Now, here's what I was going to say, is that I didn't do this at ORU, but I know what it is to be a broke uh, Bible college student, because I did that. <laughs> and so I think I want to give you guys a discount. Is that okay? Can I give the Bible college students a discount? No, I won't do this if you don't want me to do this. Now, do you? Okay. All right. So everything's half price. If you're at BRSM, it's half price, okay? So, um, but I wanted to read you this letter from Jamie. I spoke at, at ORU recently, and this girl Jamie emailed me. Hi, this is Jamie from ORU. Today is day 10 of the fast. It has been so awesome. I never realized what an amazing thing that fasting and prayer can be. It is no joke that my view of fasting has changed forever. My roommate and I have been following the manual to the letter. Even though we are busy, as all college students are, we have had energy and feel great. After the first couple of days of the logistics of the fast, I have been really able to focus on what God is doing in me through this fast. I am only halfway through, and I am so excited to see what's going to happen. I wanted to let you know that your wisdom has been a blessing to my life. Seriously, I never would have attempted something like this without the knowledge you shared. Then she wrote me again after 21 days of fasting. Today is uh, 21 days later, and I feel like a different person. My body has been so cleansed. I never knew I could do something like a 21-day fast. God has really rocked my world, and I feel like he has just started uh, what he wants to do in me. And then she goes on to say that the three things that, that she fasted for has already been done. You know, Praise the Lord. All right, in, in summary, the four leadership mandates, you will be broken. It's coming. You will be a warrior. Stand your ground. You will evangelize. Share your faith boldly. You will fast and pray. Thank you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. We're going to have the podium brought back up. Just stand to your feet for a second. Stretch. If the ushers could bring our podium and move this stuff away. You know, we were in a seminar the other day. It started at 8 o'clock and it ended at 5. And um, there was a lunch break. But, but after reading his bio, he said, man, I can't even pronounce all those words, far less. <laughs> so I'll try my best. And you're the president of the Bible school. Man. <laughs> but uh, Mike Papantonio is a great friend of uh, Bronzeville Revival School of Ministry. And uh, everybody's watching you ushers. You're all a good-looking group of guys. 
But Mike's organized the mass tort department in the Levin Papantonio firm over a decade ago when the firm undertook the battle against the asbestos industry. Since that time, he has represented thousands of asbestos clients and received numerous jury verdicts in excess of $1 million. Do you need to set your stuff up? You set yourself up and I'll talk. Mr. Papantonio presently heads the mass tort department at Levin Papantonio. This department has handled cases throughout the nation. And uh, many, many cases he's handled, ones I can't even pronounce. That's how I got around pronouncing it. Mr. Papantonio is listed in the publication Best Lawyers in America and Leading American Attorney. He's also a fellow in the Nas International Academy of Trial Lawyers and the International Society of Barristers. Mike received his undergraduate degree from the University of Florida, where he was inducted into Florida Blue Key in his junior year. He received his law degree from Cumberland School of Law, where he was chosen as head of the trial advocacy department. He's a board-certified civil trial lawyer who has authored and co-authored instructional articles on handling mass tort cases, including defenses you can count on in asbestos case and how to prove a sick building case. He's a lecturer, a speaker, he's a father, he's a husband, he's a man of God, and I'd like you to welcome Mr. Mike Papantonio to Brownsville today. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thanks, thanks for the invitation. Um, calling takes place in many different ways for different people. Uh, you know, when Ward asked me to do this, I, I got to thinking about how my calling had taken place. Uh, I'd always thought it would have been easier if my calling had looked something more like uh, Paul's road to, Dis to Damascus rather than the homecoming of the prodigal son. But unfortunately, that's how it worked out with me, a very slow, arduous process. It, because there's nothing vague and there's nothing ambiguous and there's really nothing equivocal about being commanded by the Son of God to lay down your nets, to leave your fishing boat and follow. There's nothing equivocal about that. There's nothing that you have to really think about when you're commanded in that way to follow God. And I think all of us in this room wish that our calling was that clear. But unfortunately, most of the time it's not, and for me it was not. When the lives of the, of the disciples, ladies and gentlemen, were shaken up and turned upside down, turned backwards during their calling, they understood that the very future of Christianity rested on their shoulders. Uh, their calling had to be clear. But once the calling was complete, the next question is, okay, I hear, I hear you, but what now? I know I've been called, but what is it that you want of me? And every single day, when we're serious about whether or not we've, we've heard a calling, every single day, in some small way, we all ask ourselves that, don't we? We all wonder, what now? You have us in this room, but what now? And that's exactly what the disciples had to consider. How could they convert their un unequivocal calling, their command to stop what they were doing and aggressively follow Jesus Christ to extend God's empire? What could they do? What could they learn in the relatively short period of time that they had with Jesus that they could borrow from Him to convert to their calling? What is it that they could do? Some of what they were asked to do was very clear. It took some of the burden off of their shoulders, ladies and gentlemen. Some of it was very clear. The first thing was they were asked to witness the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ because that was what would turn their world for their life as, as disciples. That was what they were asked to do because that is what would define Christianity. There was nothing unclear about that. They were commanded to do that, like it or not. None of us, day to day, have that clear of a calling. What else were they asked to do? They were asked to record what they had learned with, with Jesus. To record and reduce to scripture so they could share with people all over the world what was important about what they had witnessed on that cross. 
Reduce it to a scripture. How many of people in this room are, are commanded to do that? We're not commanded to write some new scripture. We're commanded to witness. But these men were asked to distill the very best and the most important parts of what they learned that day that Jesus Christ arose. They were asked to distill that and put it into words that all mankind can understand. And every day we feel like we have a burden that we can't define. We, well, oh, gee, what now? What's our calling? They were expected to preach the gospel to people who didn't want to hear about it, people that were on the verge of stoning them to death should they preach that. They were, they were commanded to preach the, the gospel to spread the word. That was clear. There was nothing equivocal about that. If you look at the Bible, it's all over. That's what they were told to do. They were expected to touch the hearts of people all over the world, and they barely had a notion of how to do that. But certainly, the most important thing that they were asked to do is something that everybody in this room can do. You see, we're all looking for something mystical and magical. We think when we're called that something mystical is going to happen to our life that something magical is going to happen and that we're going to be, we're going to be forced to, to, to travel the world over and witness and that we're going to be forced to do incredible acts, miracles. But it doesn't really work like that for a lot of us, does it? And rather than being dis disappointed by that, we should understand that here is what God, by His Son, asked every single one of us to do that everybody in this room can do. And that's to build the foundation for a church. To build the house of God with Jesus Christ at the corner of, those, of that house. To build my house. Now, that is a simple, clear, unequivocal burden and mission that all of us have been given. Build my house. In the past five or six years, Really, if I were to simplify it from the time that Larry Morris showed me the wisdom of a calling, in the past five or six years, I've tried to understand what was expected of me and how it would compare to what was expected of the disciples and how it would compare to what was expected of the apostles that came after. And I've tried to understand what is the similarity and what's dissimilar about what was asked of them and what's being asked of me. As I read about these incredibly brave people, I tried to evaluate their mission statement and compare it to what I could do, where I stand realistically in the world. I, I, if I wanted to be honest with myself, I had to understand where am I? Where am I realistically in this world and how can I have an impact that's going to mean anything? I had to compare what they were asked to do in their world and what I'm asked to do in my world. The first difference to me was obvious. And that is this, ladies and gentlemen, there was nothing mystical or magical about my calling. So I wondered about the difference of their single-mindedness, the clear vision that must have come with the way they were called the clear, unshakable vision that they had and the difference in the vision of what I was trying to develop. What they understood had to be clear because there were some very defined, defined commands about what they were supposed to do. That didn't occur with me. And, and chances are, ladies and gentlemen, if I went around this room, it probably didn't occur with most of you. The way I came to understanding what I was supposed to do. And the way I, I came to understand Jesus Christ was very analytical. It was the same way that I would analyze a case that I had to go try where people were counting on me to understand the most important aspects of the case. I did it analytically, I did it logically. And some of you would be appalled at how I got there. But let me distill it for you anyway. Because after I put it down on paper, it made a lot of sense to me. After I analyzed it, the, the simple methodology of how I got there was so clear 
once I've put it on paper. And here's what I concluded. Either Jesus Christ had to be a madman. He had to be a total lunatic. He had to be a man who had lost his mind. And there's not a word ever written that suggests that. Or he had to be an incredibly evil person that was willing to manipulate the lives of people who loved him. People who would lay down their life for him. But evil men don't lift up the lives of people. And evil men don't heal the sick. And evil men don't cure the blind. And evil men don't try everything they can to lead us where we're supposed to go, where we're supposed to go in this world so we can have a life that's a meaningful life. Evil men don't do that. So I consider he either had to be these things or he had to be what he said he was. And that is the Son of God who came down to this earth with a burden to save us from ourselves. Because we're incapable of doing that. He either had to be these things or he had to be what he promised me when I read his word. And that is, I am the Son of God and I am the way. He had to be one or the other. And in my lawyer kind of way, I concluded that he was who he said. Yes. So for me, there, there were no bells or no, no whistles that went off. There was, there was a single-mindedness that started to develop. And with that single-mindedness came a peacefulness. It came a calm and a, a thankfulness, a simple grace began to work in my life. Uh, it wasn't a single-mindedness like the apostles or the, or, or the disciples must have known in their lives, but it was a single-mindedness nonetheless. And I'm here to tell you, it grows every single day if I let it grow. And after that evolution, I could see more clearly a few other huge differences between these great, brave people and what where I stood realistically, if I was going to be honest with myself, where was I in comparison to where they were? First of all, in their lives, there was no dichotomy, ladies and gentlemen. There was no duality in the way that they lived their lives. Both feet were always behind Jesus Christ every single day. The day they chose to throw away their keys to all those old doors of places that they had inhabited, the day they chose to do that, their feet were behind Jesus Christ, both feet, every day, every minute, without question. They were consumed. They were on fire. There was no duality in the way that they lived their lives. They had a structure that was solely around their mission. But if I were to be honest with myself, I, on the other hand, recognize that, like it or not, on most days, I have one foot in the secular world. And I'm fighting desperately on that same day to keep one foot in the world, the spiritual world, that's been offered up to me and has been given to me that will improve my lives. I had a pretty strong hunch on what I had to do to operate in that kind of setting. I had a hunch that if I went home and I told my wife Terry and my daughter Sarah, uh, honey, I'm going to sell everything we have and I'm going to put a robe on and I'm going to go witness around the world, will you follow me today? Chances are they would suspect that I'm not quite right. Chances are that they would suspect that uh, I would suspect that in the end of the day I might find myself in an institution surrounded with guys in little white coats wanting to give me medication. Because evolutions don't take place like that with most people. Like it or not, I believe that. I believe if you get there slowly, it means more. So that wasn't an option for me. It wasn't an option to say, today I'm going to take both feet out of this world. 
and I'm going to jump with both feet in this, in this other world. Most of us are put in the posture of having to deal with that every day. I, to some degree, I'm almost envious of the way that the, 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 the disciples, disciples were pulled out of their lives. I'm, I'm envious of the way that no, there was no choice left for them. I'm envious of that because on most days, the business people in this room, if we're really honest with ourselves, we have people who are counting on us to be somewhat a part of that secular world. On some days we have to be warriors, on some days we have to be competitors, on some days we have to be focused business people, we have to be tacticians, we have to be survivors, where we have to have more than a single focus. On most days, even the good days, it's very difficult for us to abandon that part of our lives. Like it or not, there are differences in transformations. There's differences in the ways the transformation may take place in our life as a business person, like it or not. As a businessman, a business person in our community, we're, e we're endlessly faced with paying attention to our responsibility to all those people who are counting on us to be the very best that we can be. To be the very best. We may have a hundred, we may have a thousand employees counting on us. Those employees have children. Those employees count on us to be the best business person we can be. And most days, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to say it, but most days uh, it, it's difficult for me to spend the time that I need paying attention to that spiritual world. That spiritual world that the disciples and the apostles that came right, right after them, that they were always a part of. And if I'm honest with myself, I understand that if I don't pay attention to people that are counting on me, there are thousands of people's lives who will be rocked by how well I do as a business person. And realistically, most of us don't have more than an hour each day to be able to pay attention to this spiritual world that is so important. This spiritual world that the disciples and the apostles that came after them were part of every day. Our daily routine is, routine is very different from the Trappist monk who may sit in a monastery on top of a mountain contemplating religion all day long. And it's difficult for us to figure out how to blend both. And so what we have to do is we have to find a way to do that. Our business lives don't put us in the presence of God squarely every day, where we're lifted up by His words, where we observe His miracles, where we have, we can call on His strength, and we can be around His miraculous work every day. Our business lives typically don't let us do that. We're not, like the, unlike the disciples, we're not walking with Jesus, touching His robe, walking through Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and we're Day to day, some of us are even unable to audibly hear the encouragement that those disciples heard every single day and that the apostles after them heard every single day. But I'd be naive, and I think we'd all be naive, to believe that Jesus Christ doesn't understand that. We'd be foolish and we'd be blind to the fact that maybe we might not be expected to perform each and every one of those tasks that he left for those disciples, that he left for the apostles that came after. Maybe we're not supposed to be in that situation of having to perform every one of those things. Maybe he doesn't expect us to today get up and perform a miracle, to heal the sick, or to give the blind sight. Maybe he doesn't command us to record and write scriptures and to record the gospel the way that he commanded some that came before us. Perhaps he's not even commanding us to leave our homes and preach in the far corners of the world. Certainly he's not commanding us to lay down our lives as was asked of the disciples and the apostles. So what we have to figure out, what is it that he does expect? that we can do in our lives today 
where we don't have to turn our lives upside down, where we're not expected to turn our lives upside down, but we are expected to give back to the kingdom that is supposed to be built. Well, one thing we can do, and I return to that, the good news of all this is that Christ left us. He left people like you and people like me with a much simpler task. And it's a task that almost perfectly fits our skills. It's, it's a task that as business people, we can participate in every single day. He left us with a mission that was one of the exact missions he left to the disciples. In the, uh, to the, disciples. the mission was this, build my house, build my church, and build a house that will stand during all time. Build a house that will withstand the assault that will come year after year and century after century. Build my house. That's what we can do today. Now, as a business person, we sometimes might even hear that and not really understand how simple the message is. If I talk about most business type A personalities, when we hear that message, maybe what it is we're hearing is we got to go grab a hammer. Maybe we think that we have to give up what we do successfully as preachers, I mean as, as business people, and become preachers. Well, i got some bad news for you. Most of you don't have the temperament to be preachers. But that, it's, it's almost, it happens all the time to these people who have their calling. Oh, well, i got to give up what I do. I got, I got to stop being a trial lawyer. I got to run out and somebody's going to name a church after me. It's not that glamorous. Unfortunately, the simple message to you is you don't have to do that. And you should praise God that you don't have to. What you have to do is you have to build his house. And that doesn't mean you have to grab the hammer. That doesn't mean you have to try to make yourself into a preacher. I remember Larry Morris. Oh, I wish some of y'all could be flies on the wall. As, you've, as you heard us struggle, as you've heard us over the years struggle with what is it? We have all of this, this stuff we've been given. What is it? Well, all these blessings we have, what do we do? And, 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 and I'd say, Larry, well, golly, I, I wonder if I'm supposed to be a preacher. And he reminds me, I have the temperament of a, my, of a mad dog on some days. <laughs> That's not something I need to be. I'm not a preacher. So what is it I had to do? How could I build, how could I build this house that I'm certain God has asked me to build? Well, I'll tell you something. In this room, sitting on your left somewhere, and sitting on your right are the home builders. They're students and they're teachers of that Brownville school. And it's going to be right here. We're going to have the school right here. Moving, this is going to be the campus. These, this construction company is all around you. And the truth is this. They are better equipped to build this house than you are as a business person. As a business person, you're only asked to do a couple of things in this house building process. If you walk out of this room and you walk around this campus and you see these teachers and these students, you understand they're the people who have been burdened with the job to go to far off parts of this world and witness. And they will. And they'll make a change. They are the people who were asked to rock people's lives with the word of Jesus Christ, not you. If you can do it, passing through a Wendy's and handing out a brochure, that's very important. That's part of, the, that's part of what we all should do. But these people are trained professionals, and by the time they leave this school, they're going to know a lot more than you know about the blueprint about the engineering schematics, and about the heavy lifting that has to take place to build God's house. And unfortunately, some of us, some of us in our role of, of business people, we're type A overachievers. We almost can't see ourselves not in the middle of the fight. We don't understand that all we've been, all we've been asked to do is something that's very simple. 
What do they need from us? Well, we almost can't conceptualize that all, that's, all that God's left us to do is be the financier or to uh, maybe uh, be the material supplier. That's difficult because we want to be in the middle of the fight. We want to be preachers. We want to be witnessing. The problem is to build the house, your role has got to be something that you think about every day. You have, they need your money. You got to give them your money. The money we've been blessed with. The money that we don't even own. It's not even my money. It's just passing through me. So we have to give them our money. We need to give them our vision. The vision that has made us successful business leaders. There's a reason that we're successful business leaders. Because some of us do have a vision. Some of us do have a notion of how we can build God's house. We need to share that vision with them. And we need to do what we do as professional business people. We're not preachers. We need to encourage and to support and participate and show our gratitude for the choices. With these, if, you're a, if, you're, if you're a Brownville student, would you please stand up, our teacher? These people are the home builders. Here they are. You want to build a house? Here they are. You want to follow what God's telling you to do? Give these people the material to do it. Plant the seeds. Here they are. So talk to them before you leave this building because here they are. Thank you. These are the home builders. And it's our responsibility to stand behind them. The hard truth is, the hard truth is that most of us on a day-to-day -day basis won't be called upon to heal the sick. Or it's unlikely that we'll be called upon to disseminate any new scripture or any new words that we hear from God. It's unlikely that it's not very probable that we'll be called upon to place our life on the line for God's word. But those people that you just saw stand up, they will. That young man you saw up on the screen a little while ago, he did. These are the home builders. Don't kid yourself. This is what God is putting on your heart. These kids right here, the teachers, the kids, the future of this organization. And some of us may be disappointed that there were not going to be neon lights to say, you know, Joe Schmo is here to build the house. He left his job as a business person. He's here on the scene. He's going to save all of us. Some of us may be disappointed that there's not going to be any neon marquees because God doesn't want that. God simply wants us to build his house. The simplicity of the greatest carpenter in the world telling you, build my house. And sometimes the simplicity just goes right over our heads and we don't understand how important it is. For most of us, we don't understand that we're exactly where we're supposed to be. I don't need to go home and tell my wife and child that I'm going to go to Tasmania tomorrow in a white robe and witness about Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you what I better do. I better go home and say, I'm going to give the people who do that, I'm going to give them the money, the support, the vision, and the gratitude to get it done. That's what I better do. People in this room every day, I, I know you're here, you, you, every day you're trying to figure out, how can I give back? I've been blessed so much, how can I give back? Begin with saying, you may be right where you're supposed to be. Begin with thinking about that. Begin by understanding that the very place you occupy in the world is where God wants you to be. And the very reason that you're blessed is because, because God wants you there and He's blessed you there. And that's where you'll do your work in this world. And forget the fact that you may be a preacher or an orator with the spirit and the heart and the courage and the tenacity of Kilpatrick. Forget that. And just do your job. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's an honor to be asked to talk to all of you. And I want to make a commitment. I'm going to be 
a home builder, at least a financier, and a material supplier. You have my commitment to that. Certainly the kids that just stood up, you can count on that. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. Wow. Pastor, are you sure he's not a preacher? My goodness. I think if I, I was in a jury, I would go with, your, uh, go with you. <laughs> Praise God. Can you imagine he's an attorney that loves God and is doing God's will? Well, listen, we're here to our final speaker. On my schedule, it says our final speaker is at 1220. According to my watch, it's 1220. I can't believe it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Brother Ed, would you come as you get your um, lapel mic? Take your time and come on up. How many of you really enjoyed Brother Ed Slavosa last night? <laughs> Hallelujah. Just come on and set him up there. My mother said to me this morning, she said, what a wonderful combination of Rich Marshall and Ed Silvoso. It was such a wonderful combination. And uh, who thought of that? And I said, well, it wasn't me. It was Tommy Tenney. And uh, Brother Tenney will be with us this evening at 7 o'clock. And uh, he should be arriving in about an hour's time. And he'll also share tomorrow morning for a little bit before he leaves. And um, let me also say that today the doors for the service tonight will be opening at 6 p.m. The place is going to be full because we have many other visitors coming. So for our conference delegates, if you want to guarantee yourself a seat, you need to be here you know, sometime after 6, between 6 and 6.30, I think, should be, should be uh, ample time. Hallelujah. Just stand and stretch yourself for a moment. We're on the finals, final uh, lap. We need you to give Brother Ed your very best ear, your very best attention. What he has to say is of God. He's come this long way to tell you what God has for you today. You need to listen carefully. So just stretch.
Psalm 68, and the enemies of the Lord shall be scattered. And that's why ladies, let the Lord speak to you today and let the Lord validate you once again. Because in this revival that is coming, the last revival is not a male revival. It's a male and female revival because born servants and maid servants, sons and daughters, men and women will stand together in the river of God and they will be fully reconciled. That's why I encourage you, you know, get a copy of this book. This is not a book for women. It's a book about women, which means that you men need to get it. And if you need uh, some encouragement, let me tell you, in this book, I prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that God never intended you to understand your wife. You see, our wives are a mystery, and God wants them to keep them a mystery just to keep us on our toes and to keep us on our knees, you know? The fun is not understanding them. The fun is living with them in an understanding way. So what I would like to do now, and uh, how many of you are intercessors? May I see your hands? Okay, I'm going to commit myself to you for the next 30, 40 minutes because uh, we are going to move into some intense spiritual warfare, not the kind that you see, you see demons flying in every direction, but the kind that brings down strongholds that are set in our mind. And you see in my book, That None Should Perish, I have a chapter on strongholds, and I define a stronghold as a mindset impregnated with hopelessness that forces you to accept as unchangeable something that you know is contrary to the will of God. And here we are hearing a message, you know, and I've been so blessed, you know, last night by Rich sharing, and then this morning by the people that preceded me. But I'm sure you also sense a tension, you know, in your own mind, you know, some sort of a spiritual schizophrenia that our brother Mike captured very eloquently and described, you know. Well, if this is what God wants me to do, how can I do it? I mean, how can I still be a real person and do everything that in the Bible is real? And so what we are dealing here is with a lofty thing that has been raised in our mind to block the knowledge of God so that not all our thoughts are in captivity to the Lord and there is a lot of speculation in our mind in trying to reconcile the Word of God with our reality. We say, well, that's what it says, but let me tell you what it means. And so what I would like to ask you now, especially you intercessors, if you can be on the double praying, and I would like, if I may, you know, if I may inconvenience you briefly, would you stand up one more time? Would you hold hands with those next to you? Would you do that right now? And we are going to pray a la Argentina. And the way we pray in Argentina, we kick the devil all the way back to hell, you know. We give him a migrant headache, you know. We remind him that he has no right to be around us. So would you hold hands even across the aisles, you know, with the other folks that are there. And would you join me now praying loud and clear. And as we take authority over the devil, don't act like an anemic, bulimic, you know, uh, policeman. Take authority. So would you pray with me loud and clear, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we declare your kingdom has come and your will shall be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. We take authority over all power of the evil one. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, we take every thought captive to your obedience. And we renounce every speculation that has forced us not to embrace your word. And now we say, Lord, move in my life. Change my mind. Give me a new anointing. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Father God, bless the person on my right. 
Bless the one on my left. Touch them. Bless them. Heal them. Deliver them. Set them free. Let your kingdom come. And we declare to the north and to the south, to the east and to the west. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Forever. Amen. And give the Lord a big, big enthusiastic hand. Amen. And before you sit down, Touch somebody, look at that person in the eye and tell that person, be blessed in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much. You know, I trust that all of you have been given some notes to use um, or try to track what I'm trying to say. Uh, just for your own peace of mind, I made those notes as self-containing as they can be, self-contained, so that you don't have to be distracted, you know, jotting down this or that. And then at the very bottom there is our website listed. And if you're interested in the PowerPoints that I'm using, you can either give me your business card, write on it, PowerPoint, or go to our website, send me an email, and I'll be very glad to send you the PowerPoint. I'd like to review very, very quickly what we shared last night because we need to shift a major, major paradigm shift. Because when that paradigm shifts, everything else makes sense. Remember last night we talked about that the marketplace is a combination of business, education, and government. And if we want to change a city, we need to change the marketplace. This is a very important divide because we have treated the marketplace like a cesspool. You know? And so what we do, we clean people up on Sundays and then we show them how to pinch their nose on Monday you know, and swim in dirty water with hooks trying to get some fish to bring it to church on Sunday morning to clean it up again. Praise God for that, because he has brought us this far. I affirm that. But I want to bring home a point, and this is what I consider to be the foundational paradigm that has to shift. Jesus did not come to seek and save the lost only. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And that means that he came to restore our relationship with God, he came to restore our relationship with each other. And in the Bible, our neighbor is not just a member of the same Bible study we go to. Our neighbor is as far away as you can get from your comfort zone. If you're a Jew, your neighbor is a Samaritan. So that the Lord came not only to bring me back to him, which is an incredible miracle, but also to bring me back to the person I may dislike the most. Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein. I mean, God already paid the price for us potentially to be reconciled in the spirit to the people that can be the most harmful to us. But the third thing that this is what intercess us, I need you praying on the double, is that the marketplace, he also came to recover that. Until we understand this, all we will be planning is fishing expeditions into a polluted pool to see how much fish can we catch and clean it up and then create these holding tanks that we call churches, you know, hoping that the Lord returns before they die of some form of pollution. But when we understand that our Lord, the same blood that paid for your salvation, provided the means for you to be reconciled to everybody and gave you the grounds for you to claim the marketplace, now you begin to operate on stronger grounds. I believe that women pray more than men, not because they are more spiritual, because both of us have been created in the image of God. 
But women pray more, this is my observation, because what women are led to pray for has been validated, worth praying for. Family, home, harmony, food, shelter. Women, 90% plus of our identities wrap around our jobs. And that has not been validated as worth praying except for protection. And so that's why when men understand that God anointed them to go into the marketplace to claim back that which the devil stole in the garden, men that seldom pray before become praying men. Because then we go to work and we see work as an expression of worship. You know, uh, if we separate labor from worship, we have a problem. We don't have enough time to worship God. We don't have enough time to be active in the church. Because we define church as the building. We describe church as once a week. But in the book of Acts, church was 24-7, every day, everywhere. And this is why I brought up yesterday that while they were listening to this statement, that Jesus uttered to defend himself from having taken the kingdom of God into the home of a successful marketplace leader, he told them a parable, the parable of the minas, and this is a parable where a king or a nobleman who is claiming a kingdom tells his people, do business. There is only one way to do business, only one place, the marketplace, do business. And when you do business the right way, you gain authority. And like Rich highlighted, I appreciate that Rich, is not over one city, it's over many cities. Why? Because the most influential person in the city is the most successful business person in that city, period. There is no way to get around that. So then, the Lord told that parable to explain that before he can take care of his enemies, he has to have his people take positions of authority in cities all over the earth. And that disintegrates this notion that we are waiting just for new heavens and new earth and a new city and this one has to go to hell. No! The Lord came to seek and say everything that was saved. I realize this rattled our theology a little bit. But you search the scriptures and you will see that our Lord is waiting for all things to be put under his feet. And you will see that in the Bible the idea of the harvest is never meager, it's always plentiful. You take every teaching of Jesus that can be quantified, and I showed that in my book, Prayer Evangelism. Every teaching of Jesus that can be quantified shows that minimum 50% of the world population shall be saved. Ten versions are waiting, five make it, five didn't. That's 50%. Two men are on the roof, two are on the field, one is taken, one is left, that's 50%. Two thieves are hanging next to Jesus, one believes, the other doesn't believe, and that's only Jesus. He said, you will do greater works than this. The Holy Spirit was not in the world yet. So when you go through the Bible, you see entire regions where everybody has heard the word of the Lord. And then when you go to the book of Revelations, we read that John says the number of the Gentiles before the throne couldn't be counted, being so many. And then you get to chapter 21, and there you read that nations and kings will bring their honor to the city of God. Oh, folks, listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit. The Bible is speaking of nations that are going to be saved. I realize these challenges are, 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 this, are dispensation and theology, but search the scriptures. That's why as you came in, you found a brochure like this that I hope you have found it. I mean, we are going in our training conference in Argentina. It's all about marketplace and nation transformation. Argentina imploded financially a year and a half ago. And that forced the church to get out of the building, into the city, to take care of the city, because it was a major crisis. 
And then the Lord told us, Ed, the Great Commission is not about G12, it's not about church growth, it's not about this or that. The Great Commission is about discipling nations. So what I want everybody to do is disciple the nation of Argentina. And we are claiming the nation of Argentina. And so last year we went to five corners and we raised a canopy of prayer over the nation. And we say, Lord, we are standing on behalf of Argentina because when the nations and the kings bring their honor to you, we want Argentina to be right there. And we did that in the month of November. And the, the country was in total chaos. We went to 2,000 businesses that were going broke. And we told them, we are here to pray for the Lord to heal your business. Would you let us pray for you? And I wrote a prayer to Jesus the businessman, which is just a two-minute version of my book, Anointed for Business. You know, and I told them, you know, would you pray this prayer with us? All 2,000 businessmen prayed the prayer and invited Jesus into their business. On January 15, the secular press reported that unemployment, for reasons that cannot be explained, decreased 25%. That the GMP, for the first time, went into the black. That looting and rioting stopped completely. And in the city where we visited 2,000 businesses, where we hold our conference, the merchants are having the best season ever. Why? Because we went there and we say, Lord, we are claiming back that which the devil stole from us. We are claiming back the Garden of Eden. And that's why when we understand the three-dimensional nature of our salvation, we can pray on far more solid grounds. You see, we can go there and we can say, Lord, I will not let the devil steal from me. And that's why what I want to highlight before we move into the lesson on wealth and the kingdom of God is this point that is not in your notes, the four ascending levels. When we understand the true meaning of Luke 19.10, we see that we cannot stay at the bottom level just trying to survive in the marketplace, waiting for God to call us into the ministry. You have been called into the ministry. I was so blessed by you, Tamara. I mean, you live this stuff, you know. No matter where you are, you are in ministry, whether you are buying a hamburger or doing who knows what else. But the other level up, and this is what most Christians are in the marketplace, all they are doing is applying biblical principles to prevent the marketplace from changing them. But they have no hope of changing the marketplace. That's why we need to move up to the next two levels. It's not enough to be in the marketplace applying biblical principles. We need to do business in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I have a chapter in Anointed for Business called God in the Boardroom. And I would like to declare that the Lord expects you to perform miracles. The Lord expects you to live out the Christian life. This dichotomizing that I am a secular Christian and you're a religious Christian has no biblical basis. That came from the monks. And monks don't go to work on Monday morning. That's why our theology that embryonically was developed by monks has no paradigm for you to be a minister in the marketplace. We need to reread the scriptures all over again. But it's not enough to do business in the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to do business to bring transformation to the marketplace, like the fellow with the hotel business. In Anointed for Business, I tell the story of a taxi driver. And you were telling about the taxi today, Tamara. And this taxi driver, Richard Wilbur, met him you know, in the Philippines when we were together there. He got the message, I am a pastor over my customers. But Lord, I have a problem. As a taxi driver, I don't have a large congregation, two or three people. And I lose my congregation with every trip. What should I do? So the Lord says, I want you to go back into the marketplace, into that bar where you used to get drunk called Sweet Moments. This bar was run by a gay who was a pimp to 35 prostitutes. He was a drug user and a drug dealer. So the place classified as a sinful place. 
Being a new believer, he had the definite disadvantage, he had no theological training. But being a new believer, he had a definite advantage, he had no theological training. So that everything he read in the Bible, he believed. Nobody told him what not to believe. So he walked into the bar and he declared to the demons there, let it be known that the kingdom of God has come to this bar. And then he sat there, you know, for over two months, eating his lunch and practicing what I show in prayer evangelism, the four steps that brought the devil down and caused no more demonic activity from chapter 11 to chapter 24 in the Gospel of Luke. You bless the lost. You fellowship with them. You minister to them. And when a miracle happens, you declare the kingdom of God has come. And he did that and then befriended the gay. And as they were eating and drinking together, the gay shared with him a problem that he had. He prayed for the gay. And the gay said, why would you pray for me? Oh, because God loves sinners. And God answered the prayer. And after God answered the prayer, the gay wanted to know more about it. So he led him to the Lord, and not being properly theologically trained, he didn't know that he was not supposed to baptize him right away, the way they did in the book of Acts. You know, because we don't baptize people. We deep freeze them for six months or so until they become like us, you know. And after they have lost all their fire for the Lord and all that, you know, like Tamara was saying, hey, that's too pushy. So he walked him to the Manila Harbor, sunk him down in the name of the Lord, brought him up, and when the gay came up from the water, the power of God struck him, delivered him from all the demons, rewired him correctly, he became a man, and now he said to the taxi driver, what do we do now? Oh, now the ante has gone up, because now it's two of us. That means we can have church. We're going to take church to the bar. And they began to pray for the prostitutes. And they led all 35 prostitutes to the Lord. It took several weeks. Then they began to pray for the owner of the bar, who is a lawyer. Now, I'm going to tell you what they did, but don't try this at home without medical or adult supervision, okay? They bake a rice cake, something very popular in the Philippines, anointed it with oil, and send it to the owner of the bar. The moment he ate the cake, he had a power encounter. And he made a beeline for the bar to see what's going on. And there he received the Lord. And now that he received the Lord, he said, what do we do now? Now we're going to turn the bar into a church. But because they were theologically uneducated, you know, you have to give them some handicap. They were not planning of keeping sinners away and putting bars on the window or something like that. They would say, this shall be a house of prayer for every bar we have in our neighborhood. And they began to pray. And after six months, they have led two other bars to become churches as well. And I'll tell you, when you run a bar, you get a lot of sinners without spending a penny in advertising. People just come there, you know, and, and they witness to them. Well, I asked for an update, where are they today? And I got an update about four months ago that the gay has been commissioned, the ex-gay, as a missionary to his hometown where he led 300 people to the Lord and he's pastoring a church of 110 members. The mayor is leading prayer study, Bible studies in the marketplace and has led the mayor to the Lord. And the, and the taxi driver lays hands on new developments over every house, praying for the kingdom of God to be established before anyone moves in. And he's enjoying an 80% salvation rate among new people that move into those houses. So you see, they understood that they are there to bring transformation to the marketplace. Transformation to the marketplace. Last night I shared with you that Paul did not see a major change in his ministry in terms of region uh, transformation until Paul himself went into the marketplace and he teamed up with Aquila and Priscilla. And I need to make a point here, and it's a very important point. So intercessors, I want you to be in prayer right now 
as I move into this. This division between people that are full-time into ministry and people that have to work for a living has no biblical basis. One of the cornerstones of the, of the Reformation was the priesthood of all believers. We don't need a priest to go to God. Anyone can go to God because of Jesus. But because the time was done right or whatever, they only address the vertical dimension of the priesthood. They fail to address the horizontal dimension of the priesthood. And so they left the Catholic model of a professional clergy. And if you, God called you, if God called you to leave everything behind and devote yourself totally to pulpit work without any interest in the secular world, that call is from God and I affirm it. But we cannot let that call obscure the fact that 99% of the people don't have that call. But they are still priests. And on the horizontal dimension of the priesthood, they need to turn their job into their ministry. And the tension that was described earlier from this pulpit will not occur if you realize that you are a cook unto the glory of God, or a lawyer unto the glory of God, or a truck driver unto the glory of God. And whether you are driving a truck or settling a case or answering the phone, if you do it unto the glory of God, you are establishing the presence of God in the marketplace. And that opened the eyes of the people to do what Tamara described so eloquently today, to tell them, would you like to know him? Because when you move into a place in the name of the Lord, people pick up that something has changed. You know, in the old days, I used to go to restaurants and pray for the food. I don't waste my prayers like that anymore. I go to a restaurant and I ask the waiter, you know, can you bring the food? We're going to thank God. How can I pray for you? I still have to be turned down by anyone. We have let people right and left. You know, I pray for their feet. I pray, you know, because they hurt when you are eight hours carrying dishes. I pray for bigger tips. I pray for whatever they need. And that opens their eyes. They say, what is going on here? That's why it's very important for us to understand that some people will be led to quit their jobs to go into full-time pulpit ministry. But making quitting your job a rite of passage to be in the ministry is not only unbiblical, I dare say, is demonic. Because that deprives the church from the top leadership. I mean, we need to pastor corporations. We need to go to places. And that's why I encourage you, you know, get my book. I have a chapter there. If you are not the reading type, get the CD or the cassette version. You will have to put up with my accent, but I did a, the best job I could so that you will understand that. And you will see how God delights himself in, prom, in, in doing extraordinary miracles. Now, yesterday we talked, and by the way, I was so blessed by you, Barry, you know, not just what you said, which was powerful, but your humility. And I have found that the most successful people in the marketplace, they prefer to remain faceless and nameless. You know, this idea that they are, that is not true. There are a few squeaky wheels out there, but most of the wheels are good. <laughs> so now we move into the whole issue of wealth. Because wealth is something that we must acquire if we want to have authority over cities so that we can take care of the evil that is out there. We have a spiritualized poverty. We have made it worthy of aspiring to it. But that comes from the monks. That doesn't come from the Bible. And that's why I need to drop a bomb right now if nothing else to keep you awake. I have a chapter in my book called The God of Business. And this is what I deal with there. One of the things that the devil uses to disqualify marketplace people from seeing themselves as a spiritual people is that they are out there making money. And the devil tells them, you know, you are making money. I mean, you can be a spiritual. That doesn't come from the Bible. And let me prove it to you. When I ask people, why did David fight Goliath? 
I get all kinds of spiritual answers. Oh, he was a worshiper, you know. He was... No, 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 no. Go to the book. I go to the book and I let the book speak. When David saw Goliath, David was not playing the harp. He was not writing songs. He was a businessman. He was a junior partner in a family-owned business who was taking some time off to work as a caterer. He's delivering food to the marketplace. Change your glasses, you know, you're going to see it. Like Tamara, Tamara, that description of the women in, uh, in Proverbs 31, I mean, that's it. I mean, that lady is a businesswoman, period. So the guy arrives there, he sees Goliath challenging the people of God, and he says, who is this some circumcised Philistine to challenge the armies of the living God? Now, the monastic people get on a spiritualizing tangent and begin to preach. No, 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 hold your horses. David is a businessman, and he's making a business assessment. He's saying this guy can never win because he's not in covenant with God. That's what uncircumcised me. Number two, any of us can win because we are the armies of God. So he's saying this deal is morally right. This deal is doable. And now he asks the question that is important to every businessman. How much money is on the table? He didn't put it that way because, you know, we translated the King James slightly different. But he said, what will it be done to the man that fights him? And now we get into all these spiritual things like his brother, you know. Eliab can say, oh, you wicked man, how can you think of money at a time like this? Go back to your business, you know, keep sending your support money, but don't tell us what to do. <laughs> now you go to the text, folks, go to 1 Samuel 16, and David, the Bible says David asked the same question. What's the question? How much money? And he gets the same answer. And the answer is threefold. Number one, you get a tax exemption for your entire household. <laughs> Businessman saying more power to it. Number two, you get access to the circle of power you marry into the king's family. And number three, you get a lot of money. Now, the words keep going, going around, and you read this for yourself, and David's words were referred to Saul. What are the, soul, the words? Somebody's willing to do it for the right price. So Saul tells David, listen, kiddo, I'm the venture capitalist here, and I'm the guy that usually puts money in risky ventures, but I can't put it on you because you are a kid, and he's a professional soldier. Now change your glasses, put the marketplace glasses, and hear David make his case. He says, sir, it is true that I am young, but I'm a businessman. And in my business, I have contracted security services with God. And when shoplifters break into my business, bears and lions, and they steal merchandise without paying, my security service empowers me to capture them, recover the merchandise, and the God of my business is the God of my ministry. Now, why is this important? Now, intercessors, be on prayer here. Be in prayer. Because profit motive, not prophesying, profit, the desire to make money is to people in the marketplace what the drive to win is to an athlete. It's what a packed stadium is to an evangelist. It's what a growing congregation is to a pastor. What is in it for me? How can I know that this thing is the right thing to do? And so the devil demonizes that so that we will not be able to access the wealth that has been stored by the wicked for the righteous one. And people are still mystically hoping to do it like the people of Israel. Let me tell you, if you do it like the people of Israel, you go to jail. You have to do it somehow different. We need to realize that the prophet motive is a gift from God like sex that has to be sanctified and used according to God's guidelines. But when you do that, you get a lot of re rewards. When we let the devil demonize marketplace people, we end up treating them the way women were treated with regards to sex during the Victorian era. They were told, do it, but don't enjoy it. But make sure you get pregnant because I need an heir to my name. 
And so we tell marketplace people, well, you know, tough luck, you know, you don't have the call, but I'll pray for you. Go there, hold your nose, you know, don't get too excited about it, but make sure you close that deal and you pay your tithes because I need a new building for my ministry. And it's such a put down. Pastors, I don't mean this to be offensive. I'm just pointing to a fact. But when you can look at somebody like Rich was touching so eloquently last night, somebody who's going to go into business to be a lawyer or to be, or to be a hotelier or to be uh, who knows what, and you tell them you will go and you will do business and you will do well and you will pastor your corporation and you will bring the kingdom of God, you remove that layer of shame. That's why there are two misconceptions, and now I'm tracking with the notes, that often prevent godly Christians from moving enthusiastically into the marketplace. Key word, enthusiastically. One is that success is something that Christians cannot handle well. Time and again, people say, well, you know, God made me fail because he knew that I couldn't handle it. And that could be true. Like Tamara says, if there is sin in your life, I mean, you better clean up. But this idolizing and deifying of failure. Oh, I listen to testimony time and again in Bible school. You know, I could have been number one, but the Lord couldn't trust me with success. And the problem with that is that the secret to win the war is not to die for your country. The secret to win the war is to make the enemy die for his country. You know, if we are going to have authority over cities, if we are going to conquer, we need to win, guys. We need to be like that football game. I forgot the name that Tamara is so excited about, you know. Sorry, I was rooting for the other team, you know. But I bless you, Tamara. I remember when I was a brand new believer, you know, when Tamara was sharing the shock that she got. You know, that happened to me on a different subject. I went to my first youth camp, and I was looking forward to being there. And there a preacher explained how she has burned all her degrees, all her diplomas, threw away all her books because she was afraid that she may become prideful because she was good at, uh, uh, so good at what she was doing. And she was afraid that God will spit her out of her mouth and so the message was it's better to be poor and miserable with Jesus than to be successful and not know where you stand with God and I was so touched by that that I came home and I told my father who was not a believer that I'm gonna quit my studies I'm gonna quit my career because Jesus is coming back soon and I'm afraid that if I keep at this pace I was usually successful at everything I did I will run into pride my father looked at me and he almost melted me. And he said, son, I don't know this Jesus that you know personally, neither I have any indication that he's coming back. But one thing I know, son, the only people that have a choice to become humble are successful people because people that fail have already been humbled by their failure. So don't you ever come up with that stupid idea or I'll tan your hide. And that was the best career counseling I got. He said, you go there, you succeed, and when you are in the pinnacle, you give God all the glory. So in the name of the Lord Jesus, I take authority of every piece of speculation that has, the, that has idolized failure, and I remove that in the name of the Lord Jesus. You can be prideful being humble and being poor, or you can be prideful being rich, folks. It's the same customs that you have to cross. The third one is, the second misperception is that God, the church unintentionally perhaps teaches that God despises rich people. You know, if, the, if a bag lady walks in here right now, we're going to get instant compassion for her. But if Donald Trump walks in, we will not get the same level of compassion. We are usually more inclined to pray for the janitor than for the chairman of the board. You know, there is something there that is with us. How does God really feel about the rich? Well, God loves the world. That includes the rich and the poor. The church often exhibits a negative bias because we ascribe virtue to poverty and evil 
too good. But you know, when you look at Jericho, Jesus is coming into Jericho, and as he is about to come in, he runs into the poorest man, Bartimaeus. He takes care of them, and everybody prays God. Next, he takes care of who could have been most likely the wealthiest man. He takes care of him, and everybody gets mad. Why? He's a sinner. You see? Jesus never, I mean, the Bible doesn't say that Bartimaeus was a godly man. We don't know if he was shacking with another back lady. Or if he was stoning money and stealing money from another beggar when he was not looking. I mean, the Bible doesn't say anything. Nor the Bible says that Zacchaeus was a sinner. I mean, his enemies called him a sinner. Oh, let the Lord speak to you. Some people are more sinful than others, but we are all sinners. And sometimes we Christians, we miss the plane by one minute, and now we brag to those that miss it by one hour. But whether you miss it by one minute or you miss it by one hour, we both need a new plane or else we're going to be stranded here. Oh, let the Lord speak to you today. That's why he told the parable of the ten miners to correct the following misperceptions. Number one, the rich business people like Zacchaeus have no important place in the kingdom of God. That is not true. Number two, that the kingdom of God will materialize suddenly rather than as a result of a process. Oh, there are people that are all day crying, Lord, come back, come back. Yes, I pray that prayer too, but I'll tell you what, I work my tail off every day to bring that return closer to my lifespan on earth. That's why I want you to consider coming to Argentina. We're going to go on the first weekend. We're going to go to the 24 provinces of Argentina. And we're going to gather the church in 24 stadiums there. And we're going to invite the governor. And we're going to give him tangible proof of things that he can use uh, to help the people. And then we're going to take an offering. And we are going to give it to the governor in lieu of unpaid taxes by Christians. And then we're going to connect all 20. Because if you have a problem with rats, don't blame the rats. It's your garbage. Clean up your garbage and the rats go someplace else. Anytime you have a problem in the city, a problem in the nation, it's a magnified expression of a problem that hasn't been dealt with in the church. And that's how we're going to connect the 24 stadiums by television. And the whole nation will be disciples watching hundreds of thousands of Christians on their faces confessing their sins to God. As the first move for the nation to break its will before God. And then if you come the next day, we're going to team you up with your peers. Are you a tracker? We're going to get you with tractors. Are you a lawyer? We're going to get you with lawyers. Are you a preacher? We're going to get you with preachers. Are you a young person with young people? And we're going to have a meal. Sorry about that. We can't fast uh, on that first day, but we'll do it later. <laughs> you know, and uh, we're going to have a meal, and we're going to talk shop. And then at the end... At the same time, all over Argentina, these marketplace people will pray a prayer of impartation over the 40 or 50 people seated around that table. And we're going to give the devil a migrant headache. And then we're going to come in the evening, you know, and have evangelistic rallies all over the nation. And then everybody comes to the main city, Mar del Plata, a city of a million people. And we are already in the process, I'm leaving for Argentina on Monday, of picking up the top 300 people in the 10 categories of influencers. The arts, business, sports, media. And we are scholarshiping them, if they need it, to come to the conference. And there we're going to envision them to go in, into their niche in society. And don't just put up with it, change it for the glory of God. And we are working on a 10-year plan. Because the Lord Jesus didn't say, go and make disciples. He said, go and disciple the nations. How do you disciple the nations? By teaching them, by baptizing them. That's why for 2004, when we bring the people in 24 stadiums, there will be 24 stadium-wide baptism all over Argentina because we want the nation to see that we are being baptized. That's why it's important to realize that, yes, the Lord will come back in the twinkling of an eye. 
but is the culmination of a process. The other misperception, sorry, is that wealth, okay, I lost this one, just wait with me. The other misperception, okay, that's it. Now, I want to talk about wealth and authority. Rich people need to be saved so that they can bring the kingdom of God into the city. I mean, we are still in kindergarten. We think that they need to get saved so that they can help us build bigger buildings. That's on the entry point, folks. I mean, the buildings that we need for the last revival have already been built. They are called stadiums. I mean, they are going to be you. I mean, they are the most un underutilized buildings on earth, like churches. They are used usually once a week. But on May 1st in Africa, I was so blessed. I was there recently, and I met with Michael Cassidy. Some of you know Michael. And a marketplace guy by the name of Graham Powers. And Graham Powers and Michael Cassidy have teamed up. And on May 1st, they are bringing together the church in 38 nations in 138 stadiums. That's over 4 million people that will come together in one day to cry out to God for Africa to be transformed. Give the Lord a hand over that. And the people behind this are pastors that believe in it, but are business people that have the money for it, but the money is going for the city. And they're going to take offerings and give it to the city and take care of the poor. And that's why it's so important that we understand that the new Zacchaeus is more important than the old Zacchaeus. Wealth is a gift from God that must be brought under the power of God. That's why I want to highlight here the last frontier. You have this in your map there. When you read the book of Ephesians, and I have a chapter here in my book that none should perish, but I explain the reality of the heavenly places. There is a spiritual reality that is invisible. And that spiritual reality generates a natural reality that we can see. And so often we put all our money and our resources in an effort in changing the natural reality instead of going to the supernatural reality and cutting the tree at the root. That's why I was so blessed, Barry, by your testimony about the Lord telling you, I didn't tell you to do any of that. You know, go to the third world. I'm from there, so I... Thank you.